This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC and Jay-Z Microphones. So get ready to rock. Uh, We're not implying the clicks aren't good. Totally. And to add to that, sometimes an artist comes to me where the tempo of their song fluctuates and it shouldn't fluctuate. Uh, What they're trying to do is create intensity and their idea of how to create intensity is by speeding up when instead we should do that with production. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and used Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac, the speed to create, the capacity to dream. Now find out how awesome your studio can be at OWC. This episode is sponsored by Jay-Z Microphones with a unique golden drop capsule design. The Vintage Series V67 and V11 microphones offer Class A discrete amplifier circuitry, extremely low self-noise, and advanced built-in shock mount technology to bring a rich, warm sound to your studio with crisp clarity and detail that will make you wish that you had discovered these mics a whole lot sooner. Go to jayzmic.com or click the link in the show notes below and use the limited time coupon ROCKS star right now to get 50% off their vintage series microphones. Hey Rockstars, it's your host Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Colt Caparoon, who for the past 18 years has been a front of house engineer, studio engineer, live guitarist, and songwriter. His focus these days is producing, mixing, session guitarist, artist development, and mastering. In the past several years, you could add social media influencer to that list too. He's, he produced his first record when he was 19 and has now charted top 40 on Billboard, had number ones on iTunes, Amazon, and other radio charts. He's spoken at Belmont University and is super passionate about developing artists so that they can make a living from their music. His website even makes a point of showing before and after examples of starting with the work tape for an artist and developing a finished production. I connected with Colt recently through another guest on the show, Daniel Ford, a.k.a. Dr. Ford, and I'm psyched to talk about producing awesome guitar records and whatever else we can come up with on the show today. So please welcome Colt Caparoon to Recording Studio Rockstars. Colt, are you ready to rock? I am ready to rock. Welcome to the podcast, man, and welcome to the studio. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. So, um, you know, you, you, I think, came across town. Um, you, how long have you been in Nashville uh, making records and stuff? Uh, so I started doing some sessions in town kind of sporadically about uh, five years ago and then made the jump about four years ago. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, and, uh, you know, I've kind of given an intro from your own bio and everything, yeah. but we love to hear from you in your own words, just briefly kind of how you started out in music and how you got into all this. Stuff. Totally. So, uh, one of my, one of my dad's buddies when I was like 12 gave me a guitar and, um, and uh, it was really cool and I played it for a little bit and then I was kind of like, you know, I was young and, uh, I kind of went away from it for a little bit. And my mom and dad at the time said, uh, well, if you're not going to take this seriously, you're going to give the guitar back. And I was like, well, I'm not giving the guitar back. That's not happening. So I got serious about the guitar and uh, joined my first band when I was 17. And um, then, you know, original rock band. And we wrote an album and uh, we're getting ready to record it. And um, the local studio in town back in Illinois, where I'm from, they uh, they wanted a little bit more money than than a bunch of broke, freshly out of high school kids could come up with. Right. And uh so I had a job at a local music store and they would let me put gear on an account 
and make payments, which turned out to eventually take my whole paycheck, but we can get into that later. And uh, so I got a little bit of recording equipment, some microphones, nothing special, and ended up producing our first record at our rehearsal space. And um, it turned out really well. And, uh, you know, for what I had to work with and for the level that we were. And uh, three other bands, local bands that same year had me do their records because they heard it and liked it. And then uh, the next year, three or four bands, I did three or four records. And then the studio that we had initially talked to about recording our record, uh, they ended up bringing me on board as an engineer. And nice. So you showed them. You showed them what was what. Well, I mean, <laughs> it was a fairly well established, you know, studio that had that had some some fairly decently successful stuff, you know, and and uh, but I was cranking out records half at a pretty decent clip, I, th- I guess. And uh, so they brought me on, and it was about a year a year into that I was running that studio. And then uh, three or four years down the road, I kind of needed my own place that was like genuinely mine, that I could do whatever I needed to. So I built a huge studio right downtown in Peoria. It was like 2,600 square foot. And, uh, and that was really like the, the platform from which my career took off was having right my own space. Um, did, this, did you give the studio a name or anything? It was like Dark that? River Studios. Dark River Studios. Which I, there's still a Facebook page. And I mean, it's still there. When, when I first moved to Nashville, I had to make the, the decision whether to transfer my branding from the studio name to my, to my name or keep the studio. And I just kind of came up with this, this concept that if I wanted to have a commercial studio where other producers and engineers would rent out, then I should keep the studio name. And if I wanted to be the one doing the work, I should brand myself as, right, right, as the person. Right. So, um, And so, uh, well, first off, when you did come up with a studio name, how'd you come up with a name for the studio? <laughs> so funny story. My buddy uh, who lived back home, who moved to Nashville five years or so ahead of me, um, I was the studio was under construction and uh, I was like, man, I need a studio name. And he's like, well, it's right on the riverfront. He's like, it's kind of a dark, dirty, nasty river. How about dark river studios? There you go. And man. I'm like, <laughs> cool. It, it, you know, it was just, it was such a process like, and I'm sure it's way worse now than it even was back then. Cause this was 10 or 12 years ago. Every name's taken. Oh yeah. No matter man. what you search a band name or a, or a business name, it's all taken. And, and you start by, you know, just looking on the internet, right? Exactly. Just Google search what comes up. And so you Google, you know, I had 20 or 30 different names and you Google it. Oh, that's already a studio in Kansas or, you know, wherever. And, and I was, I, from the very beginning, I, I was adamant about like when you Googled it, it had to be the very first thing and ideally the only thing that came up. Yeah. Well, when I picked the name for my studio, it's funny. I had a similar story. Yeah. It was my buddy, um, uh, Pat Sansone. Okay. And he was just like, man, you got a lot of toys around here and you know, everything. So you got all this cool stuff. You should just call it the toy box. And I was like, ah, oh, it's a groovy name. All right. You know, I like I don't it. Have to, I don't have to think about that any harder. No, that's awesome. And, um, and it was, there was definitely internet going on then. Mm-hmm. And I, I must've looked, but I didn't. I didn't know to look so well that it stopped me from picking the name. Totally. Fortunately, otherwise I'd probably still be trying to decide what the name of my studio is. <laughs> um, but I did have to put a the in the beginning of it. Okay. And so then for, after that, I'm like, I put the in the beginning of everything. There now, you go. Except for this podcast. Except that would be the podcast. recording studio rock stars, which I guess it's not. Yeah. Either way, <laughs> it would work. <laughs> but I was lucky with this one too. This was yeah. a, um, you know, finding the name for the podcast. Mm-hmm. It kind of came to me. Um, I had, this was my fourth podcast, believe it or not. I had done Excellent. three iterations of podcasts leading up to this. Okay. And I was listening to somebody who was like, you know, you really got to understand that the, your brand name has to say it, what the deal is, you know? Absolutely. And I was doing a, sh- a show s- sort of similar. I knew I kind of wanted to do this, but it was called the Toy Box Studio Show. Okay. And then one day I was in the steam room and listening to this other podcast and, um, you know, having worked out at the at the YMCA and like, I was actually, I, I wasn't listening anymore in the studio room. Now, at this point, I was just thinking about it, Yeah. but I've been listening while I was running. And, and the idea was like, you know, pick something that tells the message of what you're, what you're doing. Absolutely. And I thought about it, thought about it. And then I hit, I was like, recording studio rocks. Or actually before that, I realized I was like, wait, the toy box studio show, that just sounds like it's a show all about me, you know, and I want it sure. to be a show all about exactly. you. So anyway, exactly. there you go. There you go. I think that branding stuff is. Uh, it's one of the most overlooked aspects of being an entrepreneur, I think. And, yeah. and it doesn't have to be this sleazy used car salesman marketing and branding. Like it's just, 
it should be brutally obvious what it is that you do or what it is that you're trying to do. Brutally obvious. I brutally like that. That's obvious. a good term. Yeah. When someone hears your name or your podcast uh, name, it, it, it should be instantaneous. Oh, this is that, you know. Well, so clearly your studio is all about the dark river. <laughs> no, but well, I mean, that that is kind of the the a little bit of the joke about um, that um, or the twist on that is, you know, when we're doing creative arts, like maybe a studio, or if you're an artist or a band name, mm-hmm. how, how, I wonder how those rules apply. I mean, we, I think if they this don't. is a topic we're definitely going to dig into on this podcast. Cool. Well, let's keep riffing on it. Yeah. If you want. I, I don't, th- I think when it comes to an artist name or a production company name, I always love watching the credits at the end of movies and you see just the most silly production company names, you know, like short dog studios and, you know, it's just the most silly stuff. And really watching those credits on, on movies and TV shows was really where it first hit me that that's maybe the one scenario that it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like, right. it, cause you're being creative. You're not necessarily trying to be known for something like this podcast. When, when people hear the recording studio rock stars, obviously it's about recording studios, you know, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious. Yeah. Um, and so to me, the branding thing is a little bit more like, uh, I push it really hard on social media in terms of when, when, like, I want my name to be completely synonymous with what it is that I do. Right. And so that way, anyone who's ever seen me or heard of me or who's ever once clicked on my Instagram, they, they instantly know, oh, he's a producer. He plays a lot of guitar and you know, he's yeah. that guy. Like, so, so what name is that for you? My, just my name. Your personal name. Cold right. So it's yeah. like, so part of the message is, on uh, uh, Colt Caparoon. Am, 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 am I pronouncing it right? Caparoon? Caparoon? Are. Okay, good. Caparoon, yeah. Caparoon. Most so, people sounds like a wrong. really delicious cookie. <laughs> <laughs> I can dig that. I like cookies. I'm, I'm a fat kid at heart. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So Colt Caparoon, uh, or, you know, I don't know, I guess I'm thinking of like a Western, you know, cowboy pistol or okay. something, a six shooter out on the range too. <laughs> well, that's where the name originally came from. So, All right. yeah, All right, my dig dad it. was into that stuff. All right, dig it. So Cole Caparoon, um, you know, in, in the message is like, don't be like uh, Colt Caparoonie on I on Instagram <laughs> sure. and like Colt Cappy Colt on um, yeah, Twitter exactly. and, you know, all these different brand names. And I think like, I, you know, I used to get made fun of for my name when I was when I was a little kid and it, it used to kind of bug me a little bit. I'm like, oh, like no one else is named Colt. That's a weird name. And, every, you know, other kids make fun of me. I didn't realize that I was, I was kind of hitting the jackpot for later in life because the dot com and the Gmail and the Instagram handle and the Twitter handle, and it, it's all available so much so that now if I had a name like John Smith, I would create a new name for myself, right. a new branding name. So that way, I mean, your name's very unique as well. I would create a new branding name for myself so that way I could have the dot com and the Instagram and the Twitter and the Facebook and the, you know, all of it. Like um, you might change it to Jith Smon. <laughs> exactly. Anything. Cause you'd be easy to get those domain. Names, anything. Right? Yes. Anything. Um, cool. Dig it. All right. Well, so, uh, tell us a little bit more about like, now that you're settled into Nashville, mm-hmm. um, you know, you did this recording. So I guess that, that first experience with the studio was like when you were 19 and that, that's when you got to produce your first record. Yes. Must've been a lot of fun. What, what was the, uh, were you able to use laptop computers at that no. point? Was it tape? No, ADAT? that didn't really exist. That one was, uh, it was like the very, very first days of hard disk recorders. So I had a Korg hard disk recorder. Oh, yeah. I don't remember the the model name, but it was a 16 track hard disk recorder. And it was like, like I worked at the music store. So we got all the new gear right when it came out. You know, the reps were always there training us on it all. Yeah. And it was one of the very first 16 track hard disk recorders that was like, that you could kind of afford, you know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't like silly expensive. And so uh, I got that. And then uh, I got like some Audix microphones and, you know, a 57 and, you know, like really like the affordable standards. And uh, I just had my favorite records in my head. And I was like, how do I get what I'm doing in this room? How do I get this snare drum in this room that my drummer's hitting right in front of me to sound like my favorite record? You you know, what's cool about that and and about using those hardware units like that, those all-in-one digital boxes is it kind of... Uh, you know, the, the whole era of 
being inside the computer and a million plugins and crazy mixing and all that stuff hadn't arrived yet. So it was yes. like your only option was, uh, well, first of all, everything you needed was there and you could probably like pick it up under your arm and yes. take it to another place, which is pretty cool too, and exactly. plug your headphones in. But all the only place for, left for you to focus was back on the instrument, back on the mics, back 100%. on like, how do you get that stuff to sound right? And, and in all fairness, like I didn't even know compression. I didn't know that you should, well, should is the wrong word. Sorry. Uh, I didn't know that you could compress a snare drum to change the sound of it. I didn't know that you you could, uh, you know, it was all about just right from the instrument. Like, it was such a raw record. And um, it was because it was like, I mean, we spent months making that record because I had no idea what I was doing. It was just trial by fire. Move the mic a little bit. Let's try this different drum head. I and I mean, you live right next to a river, so fire, <laughs> river, easy to put out if you get fire it wrong, right? <laughs> Yeah, and it was, you know, uh, every step of the process was like that. It was, you know, how do I get this guitar to sound like my favorite records? And luckily, being a guitar player, the guitar tone engineering side of things is, has been the easiest thing to come to me over everything else. Right. Drums was the struggle. Drums was like a decade of like, why do my drums sound like crap? <laughs> you know, so... Because uh, there's just, only one drummer in town. <laughs> that's part of it, too. Yeah. Uh oh hey, sorry. Apologies to whoever that was. No, just kidding. Um... Yeah, I mean, drums are definitely more of a challenge than other instruments in terms of being the recording engineer. You know, it's more complex, you know. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't always have to be. Right. You know, sometimes, occasionally, we're like, man, I only got one mic. I'm just going to put one mic on it. And 100%. then you listen back and you're later, later, you're like, man, that sounds killer. Why, why didn't I do this the whole time? 100%. You know? and, and, you know, I, I hadn't realized that less is more philosophy yet. It was kind of... Uh, well, I had a couple overheads and, and all close mics, but no room mics because I didn't understand that thing, you know, and and I had no idea, you know, I didn't know anything about the phase relationship of overheads to the rest. You know, I just you just didn't know anything. And so it was one of those things where I didn't really have a mentor. I just have always kind of figured everything out and, you know, read a bunch on the Internet and, and interviews and whatnot. But, you know, I was like, OK, well, why did these drums sound better this time than they did this time? When they were tuned the same and they're in the same room with the same microphones, well, I tore it down and set it back up. Well, why did that make a difference? Oh, because the left overhead was four inches closer to the center of the snare than the right overhead this time, and they were even the next time, you know? And so just over and over and over trying and trying and trying and trying and, and like picking up those little nuggets along the way uh, kind of... Got me yeah, well, it's good if you get to repeat something a lot. That is usually the key to getting a lot better at it and sort of building a system. 100%, and, you know. which was the biggest advantage to me when I finally built my studio, my own place. Um, it, it was a, a huge live room, and I did my very best to acoustically treat it with diffusion and absorption, and it sounded really good in there, and it really gave me a platform. Like, I didn't used to charge drummers for setup. I know we keep talking about drums, but... Uh, <laughs> It's all about them drums. Yeah, yeah. I didn't used to charge drummers for setup, and I would have them come in like the night before. And however long it took to get the drum sound right, that was on me. And then the next morning, we would come in and make the record. And uh, that experimentation, that open-ended, no-time restriction experimentation in a room that I knew and continued to get to know better, uh, that was maybe the single most important thing to me becoming an accomplished engineer. Yeah. I think that's so important. And it's certainly um, the beginning of my whole journey, yeah. you know, it's like hours and hours and nights in there doing everything, trying everything, doing stuff, you know, you're recording with friends, you're doing whatever. Yeah. Like it's all, it's all fun and games. Totally. Although you really, you still get stressed out if it's not going great. <laughs> but, um, but it, you know, it, it does bring up that point too. Like once you begin to know what you want, mm -hmm. Then you begin to uh, find yourself battling with going into systems where you're no longer experimenting because you need to rely on those totally. given tools. And then you're like, man, how do I keep the experimentation in, in, included and continue to like play, be playful with it? You know, is that something that that you deal with at this? No, point? no, not at all. Okay. I do everything right. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, I, you know, I've learned systems for recording using the tools that I've got exactly. that deliver consistent great results. Yep. But at the same time, I also know that there are other consistent great results that can 100%. be can be achieved. You and know, I think it's really easy to fall into that 
I guess you could call it a trap, fall into that trap or that system or that comfort zone where you know that if you do X, Y, and Z, it will give you this result. And uh, try, you know, that it's easy to lose um, inspiration when you fall into that just crap. I mean, I did 154 songs last year and it, it can be a challenge to make stuff sound unique when you're moving at that pace. Yeah. And then also um, you could find yourself working with people that come to you expecting to get a little bit of that flavor that you're known 100%. for, you know, too. Yes. Um, yeah. Speaking of flavors. So uh, an analogy for me is, is Lidge the chef, mm -hmm. you know, I'm very inclined to make one giant batch of chili and eat it all week long there because I know I can just go, you know, get it done. And that's a move. And then I'll eat chili for breakfast, chili for lunch, <laughs> chili for dinner until I'm like, can't stand it anymore. Absolutely. We do that with soups and like pot roast. <laughs> yeah. Like I won't go get a pound and a half pot roast. I get a five pound pot roast and that's a week's worth of food. There you go. <laughs> and that, you know, the, in our defense, I think part of that is because we know that we want to dedicate as much time as we can to the studio. That's a big And we don't want to waste a bunch of that, you yes. know. Having to go cook for two hours. And my wife's into that. You know, she'll look up a recipe and then she'll go to the store and then she'll buy all of the ingredients and then she'll come home. And by the time she's done cooking dinner, it's it's been a, a three hour ordeal by the time we sit down at the table. And you're absolutely right. I I don't really have three hours a day to dedicate to my dinner. You know, I need But you're glad she did. Though, I'm, I'm super sure. glad she did. <laughs> <laughs> it's all always right. delicious. All right, cool. So tell us about your studio here in Nashville now. So my studio right now is at home. Uh, it's a small room. I'm currently right in the middle of building a, a new house and a new studio. But uh, my current room is 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 super small room at home, and it's super well treated and got a, just about as much gear as I can possibly fit in that room. And how so. would you describe the super well treatments? What, what sort of things did you have to consider to try and make things work? In for a you? small room, and I mean, it's small. It's like 14 by 14, uh, the control room. And it's like it, at that level. So when I did, I learned a lot about acoustic treatment and stuff when I, I designed and physically built my studio all by myself back in Illinois. Um, so I did tons of research on, you know, acoustic treatments and... <laughs> I, I'm pretty fascinated by that. Like, I think I would totally go f to be an acoustician if I, if this music thing stops working for me. Um, but uh, in a room that small, it's it, to me and and from what I've studied, it's all about just a hundred percent absorption. Just get rid of everything. Try right. to eliminate the room. Right. Um, and so that's what it is. It's like a hundred percent treated with panels and ceiling clouds and. There's a couple diffusers in the room, like on top of the absorption uh, to try to break up a little bit, but uh, absorption 360 degrees. So I know if you have a square shape, you know, that's going to mm -hmm. um, double up on that room mode mm -hmm. for the 14 feet. But I guess in a way, maybe the flip side is it makes it that much easier to identify what that mode is that you're trying to kill off. You know? I think that that's part of it. Um and also, as much as I'm nerdy about the science side of it, like measuring the room nodes and like doing, you know, calculating out the base traps, uh, the, the room that I'm in is not perfect. And uh, the best and most successful music of my career has come out of that room. And nice. so I'm constantly trying to balance this technical, perf you know, uh, technical perfection, I guess, with roll with it and make music. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, technical perfection. Maybe we should qualify that and say our pursuit of technical perfection. Because yeah, I, I feel like not, we're always just yes. chasing it down, right? And it's not something that you actually do. exists and it's subjective and yeah, for you sure. You know, it's funny. It's like even the records that you at some point go like, man, I just nailed that. That is killer. You're still going to come back later and go like, oh man, sh get dude, that better. Dude, <laughs> my most successful stuff I've ever done at the time, I was like feeling like I was on fire and I listen to it now and I'm like, Man, that, that really could have done better in that one department for sure, you know? Yeah, and that's the drive that keeps us moving forward. So. Totally, and I think that it's really cool because since music is so subjective, it's, it's, really, um, it's really interesting because your personality and your maturity level as an individual and musically grows over the years. And so since it's so subjective, like, like the goalpost keeps moving. You know what I mean? Uh, what yeah. uh, the goal uh, for my records and for what I was trying to do, even all the way around as an entrepreneur, as an individual, even um, 
is it was a completely different thing when I was 25 than it is now that I'm 35. Yeah. So. Yeah. Wait till you're 51 going on 52, <laughs> man. You have a whole new set of goals. You'd be, you'd be lucky if you can lift the goal and take it home in the end of the night. <laughs> and those years keep flying by faster too. Like every year that goes by, I'm like, was it uh, like, I got a little baby girl and uh, I feel like yesterday she was born and she's eight months old already. Like oh, she's awesome. standing up and so she's much fun, starting to talk and eating solids. And like, I'm like, you, you, I watched you get born. You were born like yesterday. It was just yesterday, you know? Yeah. My, so, mine's 13 now. And she was literally born in the control room. She was born, not no this one, kidding. but when it was in the house, well, it's now my bedroom. That was a, wow. that was a bedroom at the time. And we could probably just scrap everything that I'm here to talk about and talk about that. I like, I caught her, oh, it was a home birth too. So I, so I actually, so it was intentional physically caught her um, okay. in the mixed position. <laughs> <laughs> But seriously though, <laughs> seriously though, I, I like to say that my kid is the best record I ever made, and that's that's uh, that's I'll awesome. never change my mind about that. That's for sure. That's very cool. Um, but no, that's super fun, man, and congrats on that. Thank and, you. Thank and you. you know, being able to live a life of creativity and and then be a family man too, and a father, totally. and have kids is just it's a real blessing. And I, I know that you know, um, not everybody's pursuing all the same things and for sure. not everybody listening is, is, has kids and is going to take that path that. either. But, right. but, um, you know, it's a wonderful thing to be able to make music and it is and, and be in a creative place and trying to, you know, include her in that she, she went to her first session outside of my studio yesterday, I went and tracked Lester Estelle and uh drummer. And uh, she was there the whole time and she was just eating it up, you know, watching him play. And it like, that's just so cool to me. Yeah. So yeah, that's cool. fun. Yeah. yeah. This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can go to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level. And you can start right now with my free introduction to mixing course, Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro-sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you are in Logic, Cubase, PreSonus Studio One, Reaper, or anything you can think of. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix masterbundle.com to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode all right um so let's let's geek out on your studio just a little bit more okay. uh you put in all kinds of treatments how about uh what, what tools do you use to mix what about your monitors okay. do you have like a console or desk space or any of that yeah. kind of stuff so I do so many different things. You want to focus on mixing first? Well, I just want to get a, a visual of yeah, what okay. your workspace feels like and looks like to you. So I'm all hybrid. Um, so I don't have a console. <clears throat> I used to have a console at my old studio. And it just kind of got to the place where if if I couldn't afford... Now, what you have here is, is wonderful and a totally different thing than what I had. Uh, to mix on a console... I really, I needed like something big, a big SSL or, or something in order for it workflow wise to make sense for me. And so when I moved here, I opted to go away from a console. And so I'm all hybrid and I've just got a bunch of EQs, a bunch of compressors and a bunch of preamps, you know, that I use for tone. And obviously I use to track with, but I'll run audio through them. And, um, and then I've just got uh, side by side monitors, video monitors, and then a pair of NS10s and a pair of event opals and a pair of Oratone 5Cs. Nice. Do you do a subwoofer as well or any I of that don't. stuff? That was, that's really the one thing keeping me on the Opals is the Opals go down to like almost flat down to like 32. And it was one wow. of the reasons that I, I chose them to begin with. Um, they're, they're great speakers, especially for the price point. I'm, I'm definitely ready for the next iteration of something, some ATCs or something like that. But... I'm not really having a real hard time walking away from that low end. <laughs> the low end is so fantastic without a sub. And also my new room is way, way bigger when it's done, but my current room is so small. A subwoofer, I think is going to create more problems than it would solve for me in my current room. So right, I just right. Kinda, if you pump a bunch of low frequencies yeah. into a space that's small, that's exactly. not going to make sense. Necessarily. Exactly. Yeah. I thought you were going to say you're having a hard time walking away from, from all that. All those dollars. <laughs> oh, I mean, that's part of it. Too. <laughs> it like, is. I mean, it's a car. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Putting a, buying a car and parking it in front of your mix position. 
is definitely a, a major consideration for it many is. of us in the studio. I'm really adamant on on choosing tools um, that one give me the vibe that I'm after, but two that will enhance my workflow and make me faster. So you know, once upon a time, it used to take me two or three. Well, man, that first record probably took me a week to mix one song, you know? And so yeah. throughout the course of my career, I've been trying to figure out how to trim that down without sacrificing creativity or the end result. And so, you know, it's obviously completely dependent on the song, but I'm down somewhere between three and eight hours per song, depending on the song. Nice. And I'm still in that pursuit of what tools can I acquire to make that even faster? How can I get to the finish line faster? Yeah, no, I'm all about that. And and I think that, um, you know, one of the nice things about working faster is it gives you more room for experimentation. Totally. Because then you can try something really quick and move on to something else, yes. you know, and not not choose to not try it because it takes too long to try 100%, it. 100%. You know? um, so are you working in Pro Tools? Is that your, your DAW or do you <laughs> a different one? I'm in Pro Tools. I just went through this whole nonsense where uh, I bought a, a complete controller, a keyboard controller, like four days ago. And it wouldn't run. I was on, uh, I was on Yosemite. Am I saying that right? Or Yosemite? Yosemite. Yosemite. Yeah, that's what I say. I don't okay, know. I could be wrong. No. Yosemite. I Yosemite. think that's what I used to call it okay. at first. I like that better. I was on uh, that operating system in Pro Tools 12, and I had been on that same rig since I moved to town. And I've just, I started on Pro Tools 5 when I finally moved to Pro Tools, and so I was like, I'm just in that old school mindset of like. You find the OS and the version of Pro Tools, and you don't touch it for as long as humanly possible. Right. Can you imagine if we had to upgrade our guitar every oh, year, dude. you know, or? Dude, yeah. So uh, so I got this new keyboard controller, and it wouldn't load on my OS. So then I go down this rabbit hole. I'm like, okay, I'll update the OS. Well, now Pro Tools 12 don't work. And just this back and forth software thing. The day someone comes out with a DAW, if anyone's listening out there as a software engineer, the day you come out with a DAW that all the major studios shift to, I will be right there alongside with everyone and shift. But yeah, I fly sessions back and forth with so many big studios that I have to be on Pro Tools. Right. Yeah. So, still the, still the industry really stand, standard answer right? too. Are you on Pro Tools? Yeah, but that's all right. I mean, this, this is helpful. I think there are people who are, you know, trying to choose which one they should totally. work with. Maybe, maybe they're new to all of them or new enough that it mm -hmm. wouldn't matter if they tried, you know, switch well, to some different a, one, know which one is best. That's yeah. a real problem uh, for me personally is because I, I've been on Pro Tools since version five. Pro, operating Pro Tools is like breathing to me. Yeah, me too. And so, you know, I mean, that's been, when did version five come out? 14 um, years ago? After version four, which I was using. <laughs> no. uh, so, you know, it, it's just been so long that I, the, the thought of learning a new DAW in and of itself is like that. It kind of goes back to that whole being fast and efficient thing. I'm going to be fumbling around like a fish out of water for months to even have a hope to get back to where I am at with pro tools currently. And so, uh, you know, I think logic would probably be a pretty close, uh, especially now that I'm getting more into the MIDI side of things. Mm -hmm. I think logic would be a good option. Um, and a lot of people really love studio one and Cubase, but the editing capabilities in pro tools, is and the fact that I'm flying sessions from studio to studio is really what's keeping me. Yeah, I mean, I'm learning more and more every day about these different DAWs, and you know, Pro Tools is certainly um, uh, it's the one that I know how to use the best, so it's going to be fastest for me. Absolutely, and certainly, I think it has uh, advantages in terms of editing because yes, it's, it's good for that. Logic is uh, a wonderful tool for coming up with an idea quickly and easily, and like just pulling up some instrument. You know, because you have this vast stuff. library, so it's great for composition. Yeah. Um, it certainly has a lot of built-in interesting features. Um, I'm trying to remember if Logic was the one that had, like, you could beatbox into it and it would turn it into a kick and a snare. I oh, think wow. Ableton Live does that, too. See, Ableton Live, awesome. yeah, hands down, Ableton Live is clearly a great tool yes. if, you're, if you're doing pop music and, and mixing in electronic 100%. kind of sounds and, you know, dance elements. Yep. Um, Cubase I'm learning is a really wonderful tool, um, uh, that both sonically, it sounds great, but also it has a lot of great production elements in it. Like, uh, like, you know, tuning and stretching mm -hmm. and manipulating sounds easily. And, you know, 
Um, I've heard that the Pro Tools is on the is way behind the curve on like Elastic Audio and stuff like that. Has that been your experience? Um, I use Elastic Audio some, but not often. Okay. And uh, I, I use it knowing that it's a big question mark when I go into it to do something <laughs> okay. with it. So I definitely don't by default use that at all. Right on. I definitely keep it off until I had to use it on something. Gotcha. Cool. Um, did I just see a shadow? I don't know what I, I saw something I thought, there but I don't know what it was. I don't know. Maybe it, a mouse just ran through the control room. That's pretty we're awesome. Joined by <laughs> by a ghost. Oh yeah, it's probably like a mouse. It's you know what? It, it's the warm weather and everything. Oh yeah, it totally is. I just saw it. That's, That's hilarious. hilarious. <laughs> All right, time to get the mouse traps out again. Um, so we so it's three of us on this interview today. Three Great, of us on groovy. the interview today. <laughs> Welcome, good sir. All right, so um, let's see. That, um, I want to keep giving shout outs though, because um, yeah. Uh, um, Mixbus 32. Okay. That's from Harrison really had my attention is, is a really interesting and different twist on it have too. You used it? I have used it. Not, uh -huh. not, uh, often, but I've played around with it and I've, I've, uh, interviewed those guys on the show. Okay. And then, um, we've done a giveaway before and stuff like that. Excellent. So what I like about it is it has sort of built in, um, console emulation and tape emulation right. and built in busing and EQs and phase buttons are on every channel so like that the idea is you're mixing on a console, right? Yeah. So the idea is you record into it, record into it and you don't have to start assembling the parts like Legos, yeah. like you might in another DAW. It's just right there. The things you expect to see on a mixing console. Excellent. Um, compression is already on every channel, stuff like that. See, that would appeal to me for mixing for sure, because the idea, uh, since I've, I have done a, a ton of live mixing over the years, I don't, I don't do it anymore uh, really, but since I've done so much of that, I'm fast on a console. Like to get stuff up and running and in a in a, a good place, I'm fast. But, you know, you have to have a big console with all that stuff. I want dynamics on every channel and I want, you know, uh, high pass and low pass and, and two mid bands on every channel. And, and like, it, it's just a lot of stuff that, that that sort of system makes a lot of sense to me. I think yeah. Harrison would be would be something I'd be real interested in. Yeah. And getting into hang tight i'm gonna let the mouse out the door <laughs> okay cool we're back and I, i've decided to just prop the door open that's what it is you pointed out like i just left the door open on a sunny day when i got and i here, think it just ran in when yeah we were, when, when i got here the door open. was wide open and we were hanging out for a while yes yeah, so it'll run out no uh, worries um it's one of the things i love about um the way my studio is is my mm -hmm. control room literally has a door that just goes straight outside yes. so i can like on a beautiful day just leave it open that's so awesome and i i really need that you know i mean we we work in windowless rooms exactly so easy to do that making records um and you like i don't necessarily want to have a ton of windows around in the control room although i've got one for looking in you know mm -hmm. looking into the iso room yeah and all but uh but it's nice to have the door open my new room uh, has a, a double wide window, r what's going to be right in front of the mix position. And I struggled with this because, you know, that's a no-no for studios. Like, you don't want windows. That's a bad thing. And I, I, that whole, you know, going back to that the pursuit of technical perfection versus creativity, I guess. I just decided I don't care. I want a window. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think that you have to design for windows. I mean, certainly there are some that's part of it. brilliant control rooms um, world class that have huge amount of glass to look through and huge see, see what's going on. Yeah. But uh, but of course they're designed well <laughs> to and accommodate out that. of my budget. There you go. <laughs> um, you know the rest of us are going and getting sliding glass doors at Home Depot. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Right. I, my first studio, the one that I worked in, had had a sliding glass door in it. it had two nice. of them side by side, and uh, that was how you got f into one of the booths from the live room. Right on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the double sliding glass door is such a great simple trick for getting yeah. an ISO for like channel. For six between or two 700 rooms. bucks or whatever it costs to build that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. So um, tell us a little bit about, you know, you're a guitar player. Mm -hmm. uh, what's around you in your studio? Do you have like guitars at, within arm's reach? Yes. Do you have, do you keep amp? Is it a one room studio or do you my, have a separate my ISO room? My studio team? is one room. Yes. Okay. So your guitar amps right in there with you too. My guitar amps are right on my left and my guitars are right on my right. And uh, it, it's always hardwired into a couple preamps. So like it, it, I walk into the room, I flip an amp on, I flip two preamps on, I grab a guitar, I plug in, hit record, and we're off. It's fast that's as great. humanly That's possible. fun because then you're just making music. It, yeah, well, that's the goal is, uh, you know, I don't want to keep harping on this and sound like I'm all about being fast, but 
part of being fast is not hindering creativity. That That's a big part of it for me. It's not just being efficient and like raising your dollar per hour or whatever else, you, you know, whatever economic th- benefits that has. It's also about not hindering creativity. So when I'm like, oh, this song needs that guitar right there. I turn it on. There's a whole bunch of pedals right here in front of me. Maybe it needs a pedal. I just plug it in and in 10 seconds, I'm recording that part. Yeah. All right. Um, I know another way to be kind of fast with a guitar sound is if you're, you know, if you're composing in Logic, for example, Mm -hmm. you just use like one of the built-in amps and kind of go direct. Do you have any comments you want to make about, uh, as a guitar player, about real amps versus amp simulations and when when they are or are not useful to you? Absolutely. I have some pretty uh, stiff public opinions on on the situation. Uh, I think that like everything, there are tools and every tool has its own place. Um, for instance, if I was doing fly dates specifically to other countries, I would a hundred percent be using an Axe effects, uh, Axe effects or a Kemper or something like that. I, right. That's a digital guitar a digital amp model. simulator, right? Yes. Yeah, amp simulator. I would, if I was doing fly dates really to anywhere, but specifically to other countries, uh, I would absolutely be using amp modelers, you know, the difference in voltage and. And I'm big on like how the guitar feels, how the tone feels, the sag of the power section, like all of that is really important to me. And I would forego all of that to have consistency if I was out in the studio. I'm 100 percent tube amps, even more so than that, 100 percent point to point hand wired tube amps. Um, And it just gives me a thing. I I hate to sound like an elitist snob, but I kind of am with the guitar thing. I'm not. I'm not looking for good. I'm looking for the last one tenth of one percent of great, and uh, that's kind of a, a philosophy to me across the whole process. Anyway, I'm not looking to be good. I'm looking to be the very best thing I can possibly create. And so, if something gives me one tenth of one percent of what I feel is an advantage, and as long as there's money in the bank to cover that purchase which is a whole nother topic, uh, then that's what I'm going to use. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like, um, audio gear quality and I'm trying to upgrade that Mm -hmm. stuff is like that. Uh, you can, you can, if you could take a step towards the door, Mm -hmm. but you can only, every step only goes halfway closer to the door, but it costs the same amount each time, you know, it's diminishing returns. Yeah. So it's like eventually like, you know, two steps and you're almost, you know, two or three steps, and you're almost all the way to the door. Right. But then for the rest of it, it's you're, you're just teeny little increments. The difference right? from a an eight inch speakered crate practice amp to a Marshall JCM two thousand is like entire universes apart. And the difference from a JCM two thousand to to the custom built hand wired tube amps that I use is like three steps. Right. So you right. know, yeah. And they cost three times as much. Right. (laughs) (laughs) All right, cool. So um, let's see, what about, do you record drums in your space as well? I don't. No, that was one of the transitions on moving to Nashville. I had a huge live room back in Illinois and moving here, there are just so many great studios. I mean, like yours, you could come here and record on such a cool console. There's just so many cool rooms here that it, it economically just, it didn't really make sense to try to, retain the gear and the real estate to record drums. And so I, I'm, I try to be as forward thinking as possible. And so when, when I moved here, when we made the decision to move here, I sold off all those microphones and, you know, the console and a bunch of preamps. And, and I sold off all that stuff uh, to put, you know, to try to be more efficient, and put into other gear. Cause now, I mean, you know, you can go to Bobby Holland's place or, yeah. I, I mean, even some of the big blackbird or where you have the best rooms in the world in this town. And across and across the process, you know, let's say you're doing a five song EP, drums is one half of one day of that process, and an EP might take however many weeks, or in certain cases, a month, you know. And so it, I just kind of had settled on this uh, this model, the business model, I guess, where I would just go track drums at somewhere else if I needed to, and. Um, and do everything else in my room. Have you ever um, integrated yet with a drummer who has their own studio where you yes. can like send the tracks, they play drums, send them back. You can keep going back and totally. forth. Totally. So a big percentage of my work now is, is country singer songwriters. And uh, you know, most of those people have, have no bands. It's just them as an artist. And so 
I've kind of settled on, I use Lester Estelle for a ton of stuff. He's Kelly Clarkson's drummer. He played with Little Big Town. He used to be in a rock band called Pillar. He's just a world, world-class drummer. He's got a phenomenal setup uh, south of town. And like you go to the NAM show and Pearl Drums has a big screen TV of Lester playing at their right, booth. Right, you know, okay. like just silly, silly drummer. Killer gear, killer microphones, killer room. Uh, and... And that process has has become a big part of my workflow where I, I do a work tape in my room and he's close. So I'll go there. That's where I was yesterday. I'll go there and, you know, we'll discuss the parts and what I want. And then he goes and he plays the song twice and it's done. And, and that's pretty cool. That. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. 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 And, and I really enjoy that workflow. I do have session players that I fly stuff back and forth to. Of all things, I've got a banjo player uh, in a different state that's, just silly. And so we fly tracks. Um, I use Mike Cleveland for fiddle a bunch. Who's like a 10 time international bluegrass player of the year. He's in Northern Kentucky. I think we fly tracks constantly. So that's a big part of my workflow. Yeah. Well, it's pretty amazing now with, you know, the internet, with the ability to have a video chat with somebody, Yeah, you can really feel like you're, you're sort of face to face on a certain totally. level. And if somebody, if you got two studios and one person's recording one thing over there and sends it back, you yep. know, you can't play simultaneously, but right. you can send something almost instantly totally. back and forth, which is pretty awesome. And I, I just kind of feel like that that has been one of the things that I learned really quickly working here in this town with this level of musicianship is uh, don't get in their way as a producer. Most of the session players, if you're working with A-list session players, which is I try to work with all like really top level guys. Um they are going, chances are their ideas are better than mine, you know? And so I have a vibe. I will always present them with a vibe or a reference song. This is kind of what I'm feeling. And they usually beat what I have in my head anyway. And so it's just kind of gotten to this place where me and the artists work really hard to, to create a vision. And then from that vision, I choose the player that I feel is the right fit for that vision and then from there, I kind of just let them do their thing. Unless there's one, you know, I want to stop here. I want double time here. I want, I want the pedal still to rise into this course. Like, which, which that, that's kind of arranging anyway, yes. right? That's yeah. kind of like having done your homework or something. Totally. But it's a funny thing to discover when you're producing that uh, it's almost as if the more producing you're doing, the worse job of it you're doing. Sometimes <laughs> you know that's I mean? true. And I've also the the thing that that I've really been trying to wrap my head around the last bunch of years is uh, the more I, I'm going to say the word care, but even though I know it's not the right word, maybe stress is the right thing. The more I stress about making something phenomenal, the worse it is. And the more yeah. I just let it happen, the better it is. Almost uniformly, almost across the board, you know, if I'm like, hey, I have this idea and I just throw it in and I do that throughout the entire song, it comes out amazing. And if I'm like trying to maintain grip and hold on this song and force it into what I want it to be, it's never as good. So um, let me ask one more question before yeah. we take a break. But, uh, you know, this one's guitar related. Hold on. Oh, there's that mouse again. <laughs> I tried to, I tried to, I went and closed the door while you were talking and because the mouse wasn't leaving. And now that the door's closed, he goes back over. To oh, again. poor, poor oh, guy. There, there you go. Rock stars. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what, what that is. Uh, who who is the mouse? We need a character name for the mouse here. Is it Tom or Jerry that was the mouse? Uh, Tom was the cat. Jerry was the mouse. I think is that right? I think that's. Right. I haven't seen that since I was a little kid, but that was the first thing that popped in my head. <laughs> you got a cat? We no, need a cat no, here. no. We can film an episode got, of Tom and Jerry. We got Daisy the dog, the oh, studio dog. There you go. Um, all right, so let's see. Uh, playing guitar. So in my experience, I'm a guitar player too, and awesome. And uh, it's not as often as I'd like, but I do get to you know. Um, come up with a guitar part with my mm -hmm. friends in a band situation in the studio and try and like help, you know, breathe this song into life. Yeah. And I find that as a guitar player, I get a lot of fun ideas, but, but I get caught down little avenues that aren't necessarily helping me out. Sometimes I try and, you know, do too much totally. on the guitar. I try and fit too many parts in, into the guitar part. Yes. When like, really, it just needed something really simple. 100%. It's, it's hard to shut up sometimes as a player, you know, it is, a, but that's so genre dependent too. I think like if you're talking hard rock and metal, I mean, if you, if you're talking real guitar driven stuff, that's, that's kind of half the point. But as soon as you're talking about, 
country or pop, it's so much more about serve the song. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah. I opened the door for the mouse yeah. one more time there. <laughs> don't, don't step on the vocal. And I think that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned from all these great session players that I've had the pleasure of, and uh, uh, the, the great opportunities of working with is, is serve the song. Don't step on the vocals, play what's right for the song. And, yeah. uh, and I didn't used to always be that way, you know, for a lot of years I would just, Oh, this is such a, listen to how cool this guitar part is. Right. And, uh, so yeah, now, uh, it, I try to figure out how least amount I can play and it still be interesting and, and, and intriguing and, and an earworm. And I kind of have that same philosophy for mixing too. What's the least amount of moves I can make to get to the finish line, you know? Yeah. All right, cool. Well, let's take a break for a moment. Cool. We'll come back in for the jam session. Rockstars, a reminder, if you're on your mobile device, you'll be able to click through. Um, we've got a YouTube playlist there of, of uh, some of Colt's songs um, and then links to his website and studio site. So you can go check it out. Check it out. And then, um, you know, if you're on the website, just go to rsrockstars.com, search Colt, and it'll take you right to the blog post. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and notification bell so you don't miss any more episodes from us. We'll see you in a minute for the jam session. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your existing Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM install an SSD drive, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio far into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. If you want to capture every nuance of a great performance in your studio, then you need to start with a microphone that is crafted with great care and attention to detail. Jay-Z Mics in Riga, Latvia designs amazing sounding microphones that are handcrafted with jeweler's precision to bring you incredible detail in your recordings. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique Golden Drop capsule design, which uses a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity while avoiding distracting colorations and distortions. Make sure to check out the Vintage Series V67 and V11 with Class A discrete amplifier circuitry, extremely low self-noise, and advanced built-in shock mount technology to bring a classic, expensive vintage sound to your studio for an affordable price. Jay-Z offers a five-year warranty, free shipping to the U.S., and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Plus, for a limited time, you can use the coupon code ROCKSTAR to get 50% off their Vintage Series microphone. I got one. You're hearing my voice right now on the V67. Wouldn't it feel great to have one of these in your studio? Go to jzmike.com or click the link in the show notes below. Hey, rock stars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Colt Caparoon. Howdy. Joining us here at the Toy Box Studio to jam out on some good ideas and talk about making records. Yes. You ready to jam, Colt? Records. I love jamming. All right. So here's a question. Uh, one of the things on your website, which yeah. is great and well done, is well put together. Thank you. But you went out of your way to make a playlist really showing like the before and after process of mm -hmm. taking a work tape into a finished production. And I wonder if you wanted to explain what that is and talk about the process of going from work tape to finish master. Sure. So on those examples, kind of like we were talking about before, it uh, those were all individual artists that uh, they didn't have a band. It was just a singer songwriter. And what I wanted to do was really show the process, like what it started from and, and how it ended. And so a, a work tape, for those that don't know, a work tape is generally looked at as an acoustic and a vocal or a piano and a vocal or a, you know, a very, very rough stripped down version of the song, mainly just so you have arrangement, you know, uh, key and, uh, and structure. Um, and so you, you take that. And I work with a lot of people who don't even live in town. So 
sometimes those work tapes that I get are like an iPhone on the table. I think one of them on the on the the website was that actually. I would think so. I mean, I mean, I think if anybody's trying to show what their song sounds like these days, they just pulled out an iPhone and recorded right. it that way, right? Exactly. And so I take that and uh, I'll dump it into Pro Tools. And um, if they didn't play it to a click, I most everything I do is to a click. Uh, and if they didn't play it to a click, I'll use Elastic Audio and find the transients, at least the quarter notes, and snap it to a grid. And then I'll, uh, if if I'm playing guitar on the record, which I don't play guitar on everything, but I play guitar on a ton of stuff. And so if I'm playing guitar on it, I'll do a rough guitar track to try to show the dynamic of the song. I want the song to get big here. I want it to get small here. And then from there, uh, a lot of times I go to Lester's place and we track drums. And then it's just from there, it's whatever the song requires, whether I'm I'm hiring all the session players or or whether I'm doing everything myself or uh, whatever. And then the artist will usually fly to town and then we'll we'll do a vocal session and that's it. All right. Let me let me ask you a question about yep. doing those drums. Um to the extent that you want to go into this topic, mm -hmm. what are some of the things, uh, you know, is it, is it typically, you know, the, the guitar or two guitars and, um, the demo. So I guess you're playing guitar along with the demo that's been time aligned to the click. Usually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then what are the things in there that tend to inform the drum part? To, so it's really that kind of stuff, you know, uh, I want the drummer, it's really whatever it takes. And this is different on every song, but it's really whatever it takes. So when the drummer hears it for the first time, I want there to be no questions in his mind what should happen. Right. So and if there's a, you know, a before a chorus, or if there's a, you know, whatever there is, wherever it gets big, wherever it gets small, um, different hits, different fills. If there's something in my head that I absolutely want the drummer to do, I try to figure out how to convey that in the scratch track. Ideally, so I don't even, even if I'm there with him, I don't want to tell him anything. Right. I just want it to be super obvious. Right. Well, so I find sometimes, and it's probably because I'm not using your drummer, yeah. <laughs> is that sometimes uh, the, uh, the drummer doesn't always seem to understand um, where the pattern is, where the, where the emphasis of the kick is supposed to go yes. and stuff. And and I've I've explored this and we talked about this on the podcast, but it seems to me that a lot of information about that comes from the vocal and the lyric. There goes the mouse again. <laughs> it still won't leave. Um, there go, it goes, it comes from the vocal and the lyric. So the yes. phrasing of the vocal tells yes. you a lot about what the drum's supposed Absolutely. to do in the snare. And then it also comes from the strum pattern of the acoustic guitar. Right. So a lot of times um, there are times where that strum pattern is, is just wrong. It's just wrong. And so usually in those moments, what I do is, I'll either take the multi-track to the session, uh, to the drum session, where I can then play my own acoustic and my own electric or my own keys or whatever I got to do. And then we can reference that vocal pattern, that vocal rhythm, I guess, is, is the big important thing. Uh, I did a song like this just a couple months ago, actually, where the work tape that was sent to me ended up being like the opposite of what. I felt was best for the song and the artist was giving me total creative reign. And so that's what I did is I ended up muting their work tape and playing my own parts and then took their work tape and my scratch tracks separately. And so then we could bump up we could listen to the melody and, and the rhythm of the vocal and the chorus to, cause you're right. That's super important. The, the placement of the kick and the snare on the, the rhythm of the vocal. That's a super important thing. Um, and I hate to keep bragging on Lester, but that's one of the reasons why I've stuck with him. I mean, he, he, he plays, just gets it. he just gets it, man. He listens to the song one time and then he's, he'll set pro markers in pro tools. The first listen through. And he, if there's any real specific things, like I said, that I want, I'll say it then as the song's playing and, uh, then he'll go in, he'll play the song once. And then most of the time he'll play it a second time. And, the first time is him figuring out those rhythm, those rhythmic elements and then getting comfortable with the song. And the second take is like 90% of the time. That's just the take. There's no editing. There's no like, here it is. Perfect. And uh, so I've gotten really spoiled working with him because yeah. he solves a lot of those issues for me. Well, it's just a good reminder that when you work with people that are really good at what they do, there's less work for you to have oh, to man. do. And that, yeah. that was my sort of joke about the more producing you're doing, the worst job of it. For sure. Me meaning, implying that um, 
it just means that you didn't sort of pick the right person to begin with. hundred percent. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, I, and I tried to do that, you know, like, like pedal steel guys or whatever. I try to pick the pedal steel guy that fits the song. Cause it's not the same for everyone. So like I use uh, Bruce Button a lot, uh, Garth Brooks guy, and he's he's another one of those guys that just he just plays what's right all the time. But sometimes I am working on a song and I'm like, yeah, he's not the right guy. So then I use a different guy. And so, um, so you're saying the artist you work with gets to put the credits on the back that says Colt Caproon and Bruce Button? Yeah. How cool is that? You know, and it's it's real interesting, honestly, because I didn't anticipate this being part of the thing. But when I first moved to town. And I was adamant about working with high level musicians. It became kind of a drawing factor for, for artists when they're like, oh, well, he's, he's working with all of these a lit. Not only is the end result, the product really great, I, yeah. I think, but he's working with all these credible people. They get to brag about how Garth Brooks pedal steel player played on their song, you know, and, and. For especially if you don't live in this town, those are some serious bragging rights. Yeah, we were just talking about that recently on the show too, and I'm glad you brought that up again, which is that reminder that um, hiring musicians that have credit, uh, you know, credits associated with their name, like mm -hmm. that, like played with Bruce Spring Springsteen, for example, like you said, I think that's what you just uh, said. Garth right? Brooks. Garth Brooks, sorry. Yeah. Um, I think I was talking about Bruce on the last podcast. I like Bruce that's Springsteen right. too. <laughs> but like... You know, that when you hire that musician for that artist yeah. and they are able to say, you know, if this record featuring so-and-so who play, you know, and then in parentheses, you know, Garth exactly. Brooks or Bruce Springsteen, yes. you know, and that's, that really helps the artist out. It really does. It helps, you know, whatever local radio shows that they have, it, you know, obviously we're talking independent artists here and artists that don't live in Nashville, but you know, they, they have a much easier time getting a shot on their local radio show. They have a much, they can really throw down on getting the, the bigger gigs, you know, opening for nationally touring artists. Yeah. And so with, it, it's a little tiny piece of the puzzle as far as how to develop a, it's a very tiny piece, but how to develop an independent artist to the point where they're to, to help them transition to do bigger things. Right. You want their record to go off and succeed. I am really adamant about Every artist, and this isn't a sales pitch for me or anyone else, but every artist should use a producer and the studio and the, the session players and everything else that gives them a product that's capable of taking their career further than it currently is. It's kind of like, it's kind of like if you want to, you know, get into formula one racing, but you've got you a, you've got you a 1996 Corvette. That, that doesn't work, right? You can't even enter the race with that car. You have to have the car in order to even enter the race, in order to have a shot at being competitive. Right. And so I view the product, the end result. Um, I'm not trying to take away from the artistry of it. I'm not trying to take away from, yeah, just the art side of it. But you have to have a product that's capable of taking you where you want to go in your career, which also way, means you have to know where you want to go in your career. Yeah, indeed. By the way, did you notice that we now have a giant fly we who's buzzing around our heads too in the <laughs> studio? <laughs> we, we could just move this outside. You know, um, rock stars, uh, you know, I'm going to give away the, some of the time frame here, but you, by the time you're hearing this, probably going to be uh, end of summer, but we're recording it at the beginning of summer and, and I'm getting gearing up for the hay bale studio. And with <laughs> flies and mice running at the door, I'm feeling like we're already there. So it must be like a, you know, an homage to what's coming up session wise. So awesome. Um, okay, cool. So let's talk about that. Okay. What are some of the things that are to, that you find yourself repeatedly um, educating an artist about, mm -hmm. or what are some repeated pain points that they have that you find you're able to help them solve as far uh, as that you know that career advancement and working yeah. with you? So one of the big things that that I find myself saying all the time, and I feel like it's such a simple concept. Um, you you have to know where you're trying to go. You you have to have some sort of a goal in order to hopefully be able to follow a path there. The hardest thing about this music thing, whether you're an entrepreneurial, you know, producer, engineer, or an artist, is that there's no formula. There's no real formula. You can't read steps one through eight and you do what the steps say and then you succeed. That it's just not a thing. And so I'm real big on like deciding where it is that you want to go and then asking the right questions to reverse engineer that goal back to your current place. Cause those are the two variables where you are currently and where you want to go. And that's different for every single person on planet earth. 
And so if you can be transparent enough with yourself and self-analytical enough, uh, honest enough with yourself to, to accurately say where those two points are, then it's a lot easier to figure out how to get there. Yeah, yeah, I know. And it is tricky. And goal setting is a funny thing. It's so important. And sometimes we do it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. You know what I mean? Exactly. But, you know, little stuff like uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the work that I do with artists is to try to get them to make a living. Because to, to me, that was always my version of success. You know, everyone wants to win a Grammy. Everyone wants to have Platinums. But it was just getting to the place where I could pay my bills with what it was that I was doing. And so that path, it, which I did that as an artist, and I did that, you know, as a studio engineer, and I did that playing gigs, and I, I've done that in so many different ways within the music industry that uh, I, I feel like I've kind of come to some sort of understanding for how to, how to process that and how to go from your day job to making a living. And so that's a big part of it. You know, if making a living is your end goal, well, what does that look like? Well, for an artist, that means playing X amount of gigs, having X amount of streams and selling X amount of merch. Right. You know, and, and so, so how do, what's the step before you, you do that? Well, you have to have the merch to sell. What's the step before that? Well, you have to design the merch and get it made. So, and then how do you get the gigs? Well, you have to network with promoters and with larger artists. And, and then the step before that is you have to have your set together in order to play the show. And so when you, when you really break everything down, as long as you're asking the right questions, all this mystical, I don't know how to be a successful artist, that kind of just goes away. Right. And so I it's, find a, it's myself, an evasion tactic, really, yeah. to even say that stuff, right? Yeah. And so I, I find myself kind of shining a, the spotlight in that dark corner that, that people have never seen before and they've never thought about it that way. And, you know, this, it's the same is true for, for an engineer or a producer. You want to make a living at music. Uh, you know, the other thing that, that I talk about when I'm talking to other engineers, like when I spoke at Belmont, I, I touched on this pretty heavily. You don't really think about how important your networking is and, and how big your network has to be. So I did 154 songs last year. Uh, that's a lot. So you don't have to do that many to make a living at this. But um, let's say that it's a singles game and you're only doing singles for artists. And let's say that you charge X amount of dollars for a single. So that means you need to do X amount of singles per year to pay your bills. Well, to most people, that looks like a hundred singles a year, you know, 60 singles, how, however many it is. So let's say that an artist is releasing one single. Let's just say a hundred for the ease of the math. And let's say an artist is releasing one single every six months. That means you need 50 artists that you're producing in order to pay your bills. And so when you break it down like that, the idea of... I need to know and network and work with so many people in order to make this work. Um, it's something that I very rarely hear other people talk about. And I think it's a really good barometer for what is necessary to do this for a living. Yeah. Um, okay. Groovy, man. That's kind of <laughs> Sorry, intense. That was, That's that a lot of a lot. stuff. <laughs> yeah, it is a lot. Plus, I was thinking about you making 150 songs last year, and I, I felt like I needed to also point out a uh, reminder that um, Rockstars, he did that while he was having a baby that year. Yes, that was, there <laughs> was a baby a being deal. born that year. Yeah. Um, when my kid was born, I remember pretty much just not, I took, I don't know, I, I you know what, I, I used my home equity loan at the time, but I basically took three months off. Uh, I wish I could have afforded to do that, I was that, just like, honestly. I don't want to be working when she's born. My plan was to take a week off, and I ended up taking three, and... uh it, you know, I mean, you've been through it. I mean, at the end of a week, my wife was still couldn't do anything really. Right, right. You yeah. know, and, and like I just felt like I would be such a terrible husband and a terrible new father to be like, okay, cool, good job, honey. I'll see you. I'm going back right. to work. You <laughs> right, know? I'm going back to <laughs> strum a guitar chord. Right, and so I took as much time off as I could afford and as much time off as I could justify for, you know, my clients that I was halfway through their projects. Yeah. Um, and it ended up being about three weeks. Oh, so there's a book right behind me. This uh, is the Working Class Audio Journal, Volume 1 from Matt Boudreau. And Excellent. and he does interviews with different engineers. And the first one is Andrew Sheps. Oh, cool. And in this interview, in this book, 
Andrew talks about, um, you know, his, his, one of his kids being born and, you know, stopping working and being there for that and, yeah. and how he had heard other engineers almost proudly talk about how they missed their child's birth because they were in the studio. Man. And he just reminds us, like, that's absurd. You know, like, there's, there is no record that's worth more than being there for your 100%. own kid's birth. And, you know, the, the touring musician, I really think that that's such a difficult thing because, like, I, I've got friends here in town who play with, large, you know, big, successful acts who were here for their child's birth and left the next day, you know, and they didn't have a choice. And I'm, you know, I couldn't get myself to do that. I just, and I don't judge anyone that that's what they're doing because I mean, you got to work, you know? Well, I did a version of that. I mean, my daughter was born and then, um, you know, within, I forgot how, how many, but basically her before her first birthday, And over her first birthday, Mm -hmm. I went off to L.A. and worked on a record and got stuck there for a year. Oh, my goodness. And I was coming back. What record was that, if you don't mind Uh, asking? Well, I was working with a band called Living Things. Okay. And it was, um, you know, I'd worked with them for a decade. So we'd we'd created an environment for ourselves where we, you know, had a way of working that was very intense. And six, seven days a week, all day in the studio, just like working hard on stuff. Um, But, you know... Uh, and I would co- I would try and come back every two weeks on a red eye flight for one day off. Oh man! And just be home and visit and everything. And it was absurd. It didn't work at all. And no. finally, I just had to say like, okay, guys, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, and that they went on tough. and did their thing, and I and I came back here and was like, all right, time to time to make the home studio work. And that sort of it was that that ripping apart of the fabric of that relationship and that that sort of you know production relationship with the band that. Yeah that uh, caused me and allowed me to really kind of switch my career and start the home studio thing. And I think about that a lot. Well, you know, you hear stories about people, whether it's, um, you know, sad stories about, you know, marriages that don't work and stuff like that, but 100%. definitely ones about bands and, and creative relationships that end and they're, they're very volatile. I think it's yeah. because strong creative relation, relationships take a real like tearing apart to finally end it and move on to another thing, you know? So it's, it's kind of gotta be a little bit almost violent. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that because I've had artists over the years where same thing, not a a decade long situation, but where I've had, I've, I've developed this, this process with them and I've I've developed them really is, is what it, what it ultimately ended up being. And, uh, and you know, all good things must come to an end and I don't wish anybody ever will ill over any of that, but it, when it when it did come to an end, it sucked. Yeah, really sucked. You know, so yeah. so you know, it's good to have that perspective on things. So when it's all a learning experience, you yeah. know, I, I there's, there's so you know the learning experience as an entrepreneur and as an engineer started from me figuring out how how to actually get paid and how to not get screwed by clients. That was like the very beginning of it, and then like. You just learn every situ from those situations. I learned that every situation is a learning experience. Every session, every problem, especially every problem is an opportunity to learn. All right. Let's talk about mixing for a moment. Let's do it. Um, talk to us about your kind of mixing template or setup okay. in your studio. Uh, how do you approach a mix? What yeah. does it look like? So um, the, the basic philosophy is uh, I, I'm, I naturally do kind of a more, I guess, polished hi-fi kind of thing is kind of what I do. I don't really know how to categorize it. But the basic philosophy is is really as few as steps as possible. And I got that way because I would just EQ everything to death back in the day. Just, just destroy audio in the hopes of trying to make it to sound how I wanted it to sound. I got an EQ, got to use it. Exactly, yeah. There's eight inserts on this Pro Tools sl- channel, so I better use all eight of them. Now, uh, and, and it just kind of what eventually, like the, a light bulb went off, and I really don't know what made it happen, but a light bulb kind of went off, and I realized that I was destroying audio more than I was making it sound good. Mm. And um, and so then I, I kind of it took a couple years to shift into this, you know, instead of boosting lows and boosting highs and boosting high mids and boot. What if I just pulled some 200 out? You know what I mean? Like that general philosophy of like, this is a little muddy. 
Does it need a whole bunch more high end or mid range, or does it need just a little bit less low mids or a little less mud? <laughs> yeah, a little less mud. Right, exactly. And so, uh, and I'm not a big subtractive EQ guy. I'm not trying to say that. Just how do I get to the finish line with as few moves as possible? And what's funny is that that trickled into everything since I engineer and I produce, and it trickled all the way back down to the mic placement and the tuning of the instrument and the performance. But as far as mixing, I'm fully hybrid. Um, I'm big on, uh, I always have a pair, I'll, I'll say the things I always do. That'll probably be a good place to start. I always have a parallel drum bus that is getting the snot compressed out of it. I always have a parallel snare chain. Uh, I use a lot of saturation, like everywhere, whether it's analog or plugins. I'm, I'm kind of okay with both, and I think they both have serve a purpose. So... Like on my on my mix bus, I kind of have gotten into this in the effort, in the 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 search uh, or the uh, the journey to to use the least amount of moves possible. I've kind of gotten into a top down mixing thing where I'll do my master bus first, and so that my, doesn't mean you take your shirt off when you're mixing. I mean that happens too from time to time, but uh, this is the beauty of having a studio at home. Um, but it'll have some sort of saturation, a couple EQs, a compressor, some more saturation. And I'll kind of like it, especially if I'm mixing something that I didn't produce. I'm like, this whole thing is a little dark. So I'll try to fix, I'll try to address that and massage that a little bit on the master bus with one single EQ with one instance. And then I find myself having to do a whole lot less EQ on everything else. Right. And I find that Every producer has a different ear and every room has a different vibe that it imparts onto the audio. And so if I, if the record was made in a really bright room, well, then I'm probably going to work on my master bus at massaging that and getting it to sound a little less harsh and a little thicker right out of the gate before I go boost a whole bunch of 80 on my kick drum. And you know what I mean? Do you, um, do you ever get an existing Pro Tool session with a rough mix sort of already in there from yeah. delivered to you to mix? And, and have you ever found it useful to, do you always kind of like tear it down and start over yes. or do you? Okay. hundred percent of the time. Okay. Uh, uh, when I do get a reference, I just try to find the things and I'll have a long conversation with either the producer or the artist about this. I try to find the things that they like about the rough. Cause if I'm being completely honest, the rough sucks like almost all the time. <laughs> okay. It's, <laughs> it's almost never a good mix, and, but there's but they sent it because there's a thing in there that they like. Yeah. And so identifying that thing and making sure that thing goes into my mix, whether it's the rough balance between the snare and the vocal, or whether it's, you know, the effects that they have on the vocal or just the overall grit and dirtiness of it or the cleanness of it or whatever it is, there's always a thing. And so I try to identify that thing and then I dump everything that they did and get rid of it all. Uh, also I should, I should probably bring up that I'm very fortunate at this point that most people hire me because they want my sound. Right. And for a lot of years, that wasn't the case for a lot of years. They wanted a client wanted what they wanted. And I just happened to be the guy they chose to try to make that happen. Right. And so in those times, it was way more about mimicking what it was that they wanted. And over the years and, and the more successful records I've worked on and whatever, the, the more it turned into they hire me because they like what I do. And that has been such an open door for me to do what I naturally do. Kind of like those session players. If you're choosing session players that isn't the right guy, and then you're trying to fold them up and put them in this little box that's not what they naturally do, right. you're not going to get the best result. Uh, and so it was this weird like uphill battle for years of like having to do stuff that wasn't naturally me and, and wasn't what I would naturally do to the song. And then it just kind of, that kind of has went away. And so luckily at this point, when I get a session, it's like, just, I like everything that, else that you've done. So, so do that to my song. Yeah. Well, that's all right. For me, probably what I naturally did at the beginning kind of sucked anyway. So I probably just had to spend a decade, you know, <laughs> learning how to do what everybody else did before I could come back to it, you know, but and, we all and really have, have a toolkit. that way, right? Like, like how many, which I love the stuff. So it was fine. I, I can't tell you how many, you know, on, rock records back in the day, how many, you know, Chris Lord Algae mixes I got sent to me as, as references. Right. They're like, Hey, make it sound like this. And I'm like, this guy's like at the top of the food chain. I can't do this, <laughs> you know? Uh, but anyway, um, but yeah, so, uh, I, I compress the snot out of stuff. I love compression. Um, 
but not for me too. Not for necessarily reigning in the dynamic range, more so for the way it sounds. Right for like a um, a creative statement, for an artistic statement. Exactly. Statement. Yeah. Um. So I, I compress stuff a lot. I mean, I'll track a vocal with twelve or fifteen dB of compression on it on, while I'm tracking. And then it will get another 15 dB in mixing. And I, yeah. that's fine. Cool. Like, it's so bizarre. So for a couple of comments about that. One is that vocals, um, that sounds like a lot until you begin to realize that vocals simply have a lot of dynamic range in the built into the sound. Everything from like the beginning of a word and the end of a word on a soft word is, is, so much quieter than the loudest thing they sing in a song. Yeah, yeah. So much quieter. And you know, there's a whole lot of, there's a whole lot of philosophies about like, we'll get further away from the microphone and use air to compress the vocal. And it, there's all these uh, natural approaches. Natural, I, I guess is the right way to put it. Natural. <laughs> uh, you know, there's all these philosophies about, about how to do that. So you don't have to use as much compression. And I've just kind of been like, but Why? I like compression. I, yeah. I like the way that it sounds. Yeah. My tube tech sounds awesome when that meter is buried. And so just just let that happen, you know? Yeah. It's like a guitar. I mean, you know, like the the direct out of a guitar by itself is probably going to sound like plink, plink, plink. Right. You know, maybe not your guitar, but oh, no, my guitar. They all sound the same. <laughs> and then, but when you get it right through the right pedals and amps and everything, it's, yes. it's compressing like crazy through saturation and distortion 100%. and stuff. Even on cleaner tones, the compression is crazy. Yeah. 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 Um, and then, so I also remember, you know, recording vocals and the first thing I learned was like, put it through a compressor. Okay. Now you put it in. And then, and then it was like, then we were putting it through two compressors when we were recording. And then like, what? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Triple compression on the vocal while you're tracking? <laughs> now it's like I do it as a standard practice, you know? Is that what you do all the time? I'm recording my own vocals. I'm triple compressing them. That's yeah. awesome. What's your three go-to compressors when you're uh, doing Well, that? actually, let's see. I, I did, uh, so I'm working on my own EP right now. Awesome. And I and I have the luxury of doing a mic shootout. So I shot yes. out 20 mics. Oh my gosh. And listened to them all back and, and uh, sort of did a, not exactly blind, but, you know, had my intern yeah. flip through and I just sat in the back of the room until one seemed to sit on top of the guitars. And I was like, Ooh, I like the sound of that. Yeah. And I went with my Roswell Delphos, Roswell Excellent. Pro Audio Delphos. It's a U67 capsule. Those are great. Just sounds great. Sounds great in my voice. And I like it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and then I go through my Calrec uh, PQ1161. I hope I don't butcher any model numbers here. <laughs> And then the um, the Calrec compressor. No, no, sorry. Then the uh, eleven seventy six mm -hmm. and a four to one. Then the Calrec compressor at a two to one. Okay. And I forgot the model number of that one, but it's kind of it's kind of their version of the Neve twenty two fifty four, I think. Okay. Something like that. Excellent. I guess. And then um, and then I use the Tegler Audio Manufactoire um, Very Tube recording channel. Excellent. Get a little bit more gain on it. Um, Sometimes I have the EQ on, sometimes not, and a little more compression there. Yeah. And it just all adds up in a DS or after all that. <laughs> so how much how much gain reduction are you hitting on each of those? Uh, well, I'm in the other room, so I don't get so to see knows? the needles moving. See, that's where the magic happens. Yeah, but I think I'm move, I'm I'm pushing the uh the 1176 and that, you know, the um Calrec, definitely the needles moving, you know, yeah. 4 to anywhere 4 to 10 dB, I'm yeah. sure. You yeah. Know? Well, in in that whole so I had this experience once, speaking of Chris Lord Algae, I went to Sweetwater. This was uh, Green Day's American Idiot had just came out. So whatever year that was, like 2004 or whatever year that was. And Sweetwater had him there to discuss his new plugins. And you know, the Sweetwater uh, theater is like flawlessly treated and like just huge, like really great sounding JBL line arrays and stuff. And so he had the raw tracks from, from Green Day's American Idiot. And the point of the of the whole deal was he was supposed to show his new plugins and how great they sounded. But all the the thing that I couldn't get over was when he started playing the raw tracks. I was like, that sounds better than my finished mixes. Like just the raw sounds. Interesting. And and that was another one of those light bulb moments where I'm like, get it perfect sounding at the microphone. Well, maybe not at the microphone because you might be going through a compressor. But when it hits tape or when it hits Pro Tools. How perfect can you get it sounding? And so then that sent me down this whole journey of like, oh, I don't care if I'm compressing a vocal with 20 dB of compression. Does it sound right? Yes. And then that whole, which is funny because nowadays it's such a, a, a thing where people don't commit to anything. And I just 
got to the point where I just hard commit on everything. And then if I didn't like it, I was able to really learn from that mistake. We'll call it a mistake, a creative mistake. And then I would adjust on the next record. And so, you know, lots and lots of records, honestly ruining lots and lots of records over the first however, five, six, seven, eight years of my career got to the point where uh, I'd like to think when I push the faders up now with nothing on it, it's like, how do I not screw this up in the mix? Right, right. Yeah. Instead of what all do I got to fix? It's how can I not ruin what, how great this already is. That's, that was a quote from Richard Dodd when he was on the podcast was talking about um, learning as an engineer, like how to not get in the way of the music. Totally. You know? Yeah. And, and it's, not it's a hard it concept, I think, to wrap your head around at, in the early days. But the more mature you get and the better music that you, you are have the opportunity to work on, the more that that is so important and the more obvious that is, I think. Yeah, yeah I think you got to go around and bump into all the walls of a room before you know uh, where they are, you know. Be, what were those vacuum cleaners? A, a Roomba? A Roomba. You got to be a Roomba, a mix <laughs> I, I was a mixing Roomba for like a decade. <laughs> all right. Um, let's see if we can get you to share any more mixing tricks, stuff that, that's really want. useful. Um Let's see, uh, guitar. Let's let's okay. talk about guitars. What are some things that are fun to do to the guitars at the mix stage okay. to make them sound cooler? Do they get compression EQs? Mm -hmm. do, do you widen them out? Do you add effects to them? Any of that stuff? Well, uh, widening out. I'm I'm on the appropriate thing on a more rock th on a rock thing or a rock country thing or and I do some metal too on a metal thing. It's all about how different can I get the two sides? You know, you, you double track everything in those situations. I shouldn't say that as a rule, but generally speaking, you double track all the guitars. And the more different you can get the two sides, and then you pan them hard left and right. And the more different you can get those two sides to sound, the wider and the bigger everything is. Now, do you do that as a, did you double track them with the same guitar, same amp, and mm -hmm. then do something different? So ideally in the tracking phase, it's different guitar, different amp, different speaker, different microphones, different mic preamp. Right. Literally same everything. part. Same part, yes. Same player even. And a lot of times if the band has two players, if they're humble enough and willing, I'll even pick the better rhythm player and make him play both parts. So, um let's say you doubled it but use the same guitar and amp and mm -hmm. mics and everything. What is it about that kind of doubled sound that you don't like that you like more when you switch things up? It's just too similar. You know, uh, in Pro Tools, you can have a stereo track that's playing something that's mono. And even though the two sides are panned left and right, it's mono. And so that principle, I think, follows through into the guitar thing. If the guitars are literally the exact same thing, well, they're right up the middle, just like if it was mono. Um and so th that is the driving force. It was really, when I was 14, here's another part of the story. When I was 14, I got, I think it was a cassette tape, like four track recorder. And I remember the first time that I, I played the same thing twice and panned it left and right. And like, you know, I'm 14 years old. I didn't know up from down back then. And my mind was like blown. I'm like, it's so huge sounding like, and so that just sent me down this whole path of, of trying to figure out how to make it bigger and wider. And like, you know, those tiny little half of 1% like, uh, but so in the mixing phase, if, if it's too similar, I'll often use entirely different like plugin chains. So different EQs, uh, I'll use flavorful EQs, you know, an API and a Neve or like something that's very different. Uh, and then the entire chain, different saturation, different compressor, different compressors. That's a hard word to I say. Like compressors. I, I, I can compressor some stuff. Uh, and so I just try to create the difference without necessarily EQing stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I dig that. And, and that's a great reminder. That's a really good tip because the first thing I'll do is if I've got a left guitar and a right guitar, mm -hmm. I take those plugins that are on the left one option, drag them down to the right one. It's so uh -huh. quick and easy. It is. And you're making a great point, which is like, no, don't do that. Yeah. Switch it up. Also, you might enjoy this. So Steve Albini of uh -huh. Chicago, just, uh, I don't know how far north that is from Peoria. Uh, about two hours. Two hours. All yeah. right. So spent a lot of time in Chicago. He was just on the podcast before you. Oh, excellent. Um, so uh, whoever is listening to this episode may have just heard Steve's That's recently so too. That's so awesome. But uh, he made a great point as well about doubling guitars. And mm -hmm. he said, 
um, you know, switch guitars. Even if you don't switch amps and mics, switch yes. guitars, and that'll make a, a great difference. I just think any single thing that you can switch, if you only have one guitar, but you've got two different amps or two different speaker cabs, or you've got a 57 and a, and a 121 or whatever, just anything that you can switch up, regardless, eh, I think it's really important to we we can get lost you know we're all gear nerds we can get lost down this path of like oh i don't have this gear so i can't make this work but i think being doing the very best with what you have at any stage of the game is super important so i mean maybe you just have a radio shack mic and a 57 we'll use those two you know what i mean if if you've got uh, the worst squire on planet earth for a guitar and your les paul perfect use those two you know as long as it plays in tune uh just whatever you can change uh, and i think you know it's very rare that that a guitar player only has one guitar and it's very rare that anywhere that you're going to record only has one single microphone and so just change anything even if it's not the very best thing possible the fact that it's different is important okay uh you brought up a point yeah you said as long as it plays in tune how, how often <laughs> Have you found it useful for a guitar to be out of tune on a recording? Oh, man. Okay, so I have this philosophy, and this goes into vocal performance. It really is everything. Sharp and early creates intention, uh, intensity um, and, and animosity, and like it, it's uncomfortable. Flat and late is comforting and relaxing. And so... Um, if I'm going to be out of tune as a guitar player, it's going to be not because the guitar is out of tune. It's going to be intentional. It's going to be I'm reaching for this big bend at the end of a solo, and I'm going to bend it a tenth of a step over where it's supposed to be to create more intensity. Um, so those are the and same with the vocal. Like if you're a real chill vocal in a, in a verse, it's okay if some of the notes are flat. It creates more. Not really flat, but like we're talking like <laughs> like sense here. Right, right. Um, it's okay if it's a little flat because it's relaxing. And if they're reaching for the the climax of the song at the end of the bridge, right before the breakdown, let it be sharp. It's okay. So there's an interesting thought that comes to mind about that. You know, we, we live in a world, um, in the Western world of equal tempered tuning, which <laughs> some people describe as being everything being equally out of tune, right? Okay. okay. And then, you know, perfect tunings, uh, fourths and fifths when you're uh -huh. tuning up your guitar and you're just tuning like two or three notes and you get it. It's like, Oh yeah. Awesome. And then you yeah. go play a, a D chord yeah. and you're like, what the hell? Yeah. That's what equal temper tuning was designed to fix. It's mm -hmm. like, get everything pretty dang close. Totally. Um, but you know, those are because of instruments that have pre-selected intervals, right? Sure. But you're, you're making a good point with the, with the human voice, mm -hmm. we can hit whatever note we want to, sure. you know, or when so you're bending or when you're on a pedal steel or a dobro or a, any sort of open tuning thing. Yeah. Yeah. Violin, any stringed, any classical stringed instrument. Well, with my violin, it was usually better if I played it in tune. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's just better if I don't ever pick up a violin ever. <laughs> Sorry. The, the bow bugs got my bow. So it, it hasn't come out of the case in a minute. Oh, Do you man. know about that? Do you know that bow bugs exist? Is that, I, that's a real thing. It's a real thing, man. I went is, to is open it like bed bugs. I hope not. But uh, <laughs> I went to because I'm putting that thing under my chin when it works, you know. But but uh, I went to go pick up my violin, open up the case, and it looked like the bow had just exploded, like a bomb went off, really? firecracker went off in the middle, and hit bow hairs the same every direction. And I I talked to the violin guy, and he was like, he was like, oh yeah, bow bugs. I that's like, not like what? blinker fluid, like he was like pulling your chain, right? Like that's <laughs> <laughs> blinker fluid. Like that. <laughs> like, uh, is it the is it like the 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 synthetic material or the horse hair or the rosin or yeah, what? the horse hair just gets eaten by these little creatures that get in the case, no kid, and uh, and just start chowing down on it. And you pull it out one day and you ain't got no bow. That is something that I've never heard before. That that's. That's by the way, I was great. thinking after this podcast, if you yes. get free time, we'll go snipe hunting too. Oh, to cool! That. All right, dig yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> Snipe, um, and what's what's the other one? I'm totally ruining this by talking yeah, about this. Snipe hunting, but you need a flashlight, right? That's what you need. Right, and then the uh, oh, the rabbit with the horns that you see. What's oh, that? Jackalopes? Jackalopes. Yeah. Go jackalope hunting. Uh, it's not it. nearly as funny since I ruined it like that, but... <laughs> Hey, 
This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy. Are you ready to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level and make your best record ever? Then visit the Academy to find the course that's right for you. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you are ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own record, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. These techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you are using right now. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins in Pro Tools. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads to mix in your own studio and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle bundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode all right um let's jump into some specifics here okay uh sam williams dark water yeah which was recorded at dark river no well, that was actually a blackbird okay it was a blackbird okay yep. never mind i just threw that in there just for all of it um it's got some great harmonica on it yes and i wondered if you wanted to talk about cool tips or thoughts around recording harmonica and getting yeah, it to sound groovy. Um, it's that's probably the thing, the single thing that I'm least experienced at. But man, that was a cool session. So the harmonica was Jimmy Hall, uh, who's Jeff Beck's singer, and uh, he's such a cool dude. And and like his flavor that that just naturally comes out of him when he plays is just it was so perfect for that song. It was so smoky and dirty, and yeah, you know, I just I don't really even know how to describe it. But on that song, um, I'm trying to remember that was a long time ago. Uh, we were using an RCA 44 and probably a 67 simultaneously. Cool. And it was probably going, we, that was in Studio B at Blackbird. And so it probably would have been going through a 31105 and no compression. 99% sure that would have been the third. Thing. What's the 31105? Is that the, the Neve? Neve thing? Yeah, with the EQ. Um, is that, I think it's ba is close to a 1081, I think, I with the EQ. It. I believe it. Is that right? I it don't could know. could be. I don't remember. Uh, yeah, there's too many. I <laughs> you know, get really lost on the old niche It's stuff. funny because like a decade ago when I was really working on in different studios uh -huh. on different gear, you know, putting my hands on much, much more high-end stuff before I started my home studio, mm -hmm. I used to just like hold all these, these uh, model numbers in my head and uh -huh. everything and riff on them so quickly. And it's funny how quickly you just let go of all, a lot of that stuff afterwards. Man. And now you're just like, truth. what's the name of that plugin I use? I don't know. I know what it looks like. <laughs> I know how far down it is on my compressor list in my plugin window. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And, and it was just, uh, we just did a bunch of takes and we just kind of worked it out in there. He had not heard the song before he walked in. And uh, I, I got the feeling that he was a pretty unattainable character to play harmonica on something and he but he was a close friend of the williams family and so um you know sam made a call or probably sam's dad actually made the call i'm sure uh hank jr and so uh it was just an awesome session it was very cool uh to date my favorite harmonica thing ever like it's cool yeah harmonica is fun i mean i've done some different versions of it i've done it where a harp player is playing into the bullet mic you know mm -hmm. And um, I remember one we did, We I have this um, True Tone amp, a little tiny one, and it just yeah. sounded so sweet on the harmonica. It's a weird amp. You could play like a power chord in it and yeah. hear a major third in there. Oh. It like does this overtone thing where you're like, ooh, that's cool, you know? See, that, there's so many of those little, and they don't even have to be expensive. There's so many of those little things that when you find those little magic, those little nuggets of magic, you got to hang on to that stuff. Yeah, and let's see, what else did we do? So then we... Um, I tried putting my U67 on the um, on the amp, and that sounded pretty good, but it didn't sound quite what I was looking for. And then mm -hmm. I put it into figure eight mode so that it was also hearing mm -hmm. the natural harmonica and like halfway between the amp and the harmonica oh, itself. yeah. And it was like, all of a sudden, that was like this perfect blend. That See, was that's fun. cool. I'm pretty sure um, most of what was used in the mix of that song was the 44. Uh, I, I, I'm 99% I'm sure. It's, again, it's been three or four years ago that we did that song. But the 67 was just like a fail safe. It's like, eh, 67 sound great. Throw it up there. 
just in case, you know, especially there's a lot of that that happens when I'm doing bigger sessions at bigger studios. Those rooms are expensive. And so you just capture everything. Right. If capture they're going to give me a 44 and a 67 without charging me for it, then I'm using both of them. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And find I'll out sort later. it out later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally interesting. Um, that is a good reason to uh, maybe uh, not commit to a couple of things. A couple of things. A couple yeah. of things. I'm big on committing to uh, performances. And like we chose the microphone. I didn't have him do four takes with f four different micro or harmonicas, not microphone. You know, we, we chose the, the harmonica. This is the vibe. This is the sound that's happening. But, you know, you're capturing it through really incredible gear in a really incredible room that also costs a really incredible amount of money per day. And so, yeah, get a couple options. We did that. In fact, that same band, L Living Things, we were there mixing. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> this was at a time where... We were just blasting through funds and stuff like that. But we were, I think we were there for four days mixing to work on one song. Which, oh my Studio God. Studio A. Oh my God. Early on. Um, and That's uh, an expensive mix. And we were like, we were, we, you know, they had every option. So we were like, well, we want to hear everything on everything. Yeah. So we went one by one, like just patched in so did, many things. How many Fairchilds did you, did you have on that mix? Well... Probably a few, but believe <laughs> believe it or not, we had one to work with in the home studio too. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Oh, actually, no, that might not be true. I think that wasn't true. No, no, we were we had we were renting it. That's what we were doing. Okay. We were renting them whenever we needed to from Blackbird, I think. Well, I mean, that's such a cool. good option because I mean, what, what's the last six seventy go for that you saw for sale? I mean, you, as much as your house. Oh yeah, fifty grand yeah, or something it, or more. It, and at exactly. this point, it probably right. Yeah, a very very nice Cadillac or, or Mercedes. Yeah, and um, you know, I don't know what they charge to rent a Fairchild, but a couple hundred bucks a day, three hundred bucks a day, whatever it is. Yeah. And so so I was having this conversation with someone the other day that the hole in my mic locker for for vocal mics is a two fifty one. I don't have a two fifty one thing yet. And uh, there's a bunch of different cool options out there, but vintage ones cost a fortune. And even the the clones that are really great, they're three to five thousand dollars, but I can get one from Blackbird for a hundred bucks a day, yeah. a real one, a real vintage. Which is one. ironically a better business model than building a studio and trying to book it by the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. And so you know you have to decide like, okay, so I can get a real vintage two fifty one for thirty days before I equal the cost of the cheapest good clone of a of a two fifty one, like what's the better economical thing to do? And that's a hard decision. Yeah. Right. But anyway. Uh, um, okay, cool. So let's see. Um, another, another question. Hunter yes. Price left behind yeah. another um, song you sent me mm -hmm. has what I would describe as a big wash of reverb. And I wondered if you wanted to talk about stuff you've learned about, including a lot of ambience in a production. Yeah. Useful, useful tricks or stuff that gets in your way. Totally. So uh, probably the best thing to do is, is break that song down. Um, when he came to me with the work tape of that song, which by the way, that song is one of the few songs other than the pedal steel, that song's a hundred percent me. I did literally every single thing on that song. I programmed all the drums because there wasn't time for, to, to get a drummer. So Hunter was on, uh, America's got talent. One of the talent shows, I think it was America's got talent. And, uh, he went pretty far, like right to the main show. And, uh, he came to me after they filmed it and he's like, Hey, this episode's going to air in seven days. Can we have this song done and out in seven days, which gave us like three days to actually do the song. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. And uh, the only direction he gave me was I want some sort of marching cadence snare thing. And it was literally the only direction. Uh, and it was a unique song that nothing popped out at me production wise. So it was one of those moments where all those tools are at my fingertips and it just go. Like there's not even time to second guess anything, just go. And, uh, what ended up happening was because of that snare cadence thing, I was like, I want this to sound enormous. Like it's in a big room. And so then that kind of transferred into everything. Uh, Smith Curry played the pedal steel on that particular song. Smith's great. He's been on the podcast too. Excellent. Excellent. I love Smith. He's such a, such a cool dude. Um, so he did pedal steel on that song. And that was kind of early on in the process. Like we had the song roughly laid out, percussion programmed, and, and like the acoustic was down, the finger-picked acoustic was down. And uh, he just came in and 
I don't know if you've tracked him before or not, but he's got a pedal board that's like the size of this control room. It's a monster. It's yeah. so ridiculous. I was like, man, I'm looking at it drooling, <laughs> trying not to drool on the pedal board. It's such a ridiculous pedal board, but you can tell that like he's he's really handpicked those things intentionally. And so he came in and he just did this, how that intro, that that little steel lick in the intro of that song, and it had this just beautiful delay and reverb on it. And I was like, okay. I had already felt that with the snare thing. We're just, we're going to embrace this and we're going to go all the way down this road. And um, so there's like whole note pianos, uh, like octave piano on the, uh, on the, the chord changes in that song compressed as hard as I could compress it with the biggest reverb I could possibly put on it, you know, and, and set in the background. And then his voice was such an interesting, unique thing. And he's, a it, we were talking about dynamic singers he is the most dynamic singer I've ever even I've ever experienced in my life. And so figuring out how to rein him in and with compression, that's a whole different topic. But do you remember some of the compressors you ended up using on that? Uh, it would have been the tube tech while tracking. I got an LCA 2B that I this is blasphemous to a lot of people. I like it more than a CL 1B. It's my one of my favorite vocal compressors of all time. Right, And that 2B is one that you um, at first glance, you might think it was for the, the mix bus or for stereo, yeah, stereo. buses, right? Yeah. Yeah. But the, I just use one side of it for, for vocals and it's, it's just so smooth. It's just creamy, smooth compression, no matter how hard I'm hitting it. But anyway, um, uh, so vocal compression would have been that. And I mean, slamming him, like coaching him with his performance and then like coaching him with his mic technique. So he was pulling off just the right amount without ruining the proximity effect and like, and, uh, and then driving the compressor. I mean, 20, 25 D. I mean, the meter was all the way down. And, uh, and, uh, then in the mix, it would have been the cappy. Is it the five, the five twenty six cappy compressor? Um, and then it would have been probably the UAD blue stripe 1176. And then probably, and that would have been hitting, I'm sure 10, 12, 15 DB. And the cappy would have been hitting 15 or 20 DB. And then probably a fab filter multiband at the end of all of mm -hmm. that, kind of just leveling, leveling everything out. Um, but yeah, so, it, and it just kind of became this thing where everything was like just, it was a slow tempo song, really, and the chorus goes half time, so it's really slow, and there's a lot of room for it. So it's kind of one of my things where like you have to decide what, it, what there's room for in the song, and so... Some songs, there's not room for big reverb. There's there's just not, and it makes everything sound cluttered and muddy. And this was a song that had, you know, big hits on the whole notes or on the chord, on the chord changes. All right, probably slower tempo. Real slow tempo and, and halftime at that, you know, even though it's a big song that doesn't... And then, so that was also part of it, is how do we make this big, slow song not sound slow and boring? So the shaker and how the snare plays and since I did program those drums, how to, how to program the drum around the vocal. Cause I don't have Lester doing what he naturally does. It's, it was up to me. And so I, I, I was doing the whole, what would Lester do thing, you know, but That's um, a, it's interesting that you brought a percussion though, because I've, I've noticed that too, that there are song tempos where when you're playing the guitar and you're putting it down, you know, that that's the right tempo for mm -hmm. it. You, like, you know, this is it. That is the right tempo. Yeah. But then later after you've recorded it well and tracked it, maybe it's just guitar based drums or something. You come back and listen and you're like, you're like, man, this, this is a little bit dragon, but, yes. but it doesn't need to be faster. Exactly. And, and, um, you know, I've, I've thought about that and, and I agree with you that, Sometimes what it's missing is it's just missing that subdivision element. Yeah, just move, which has a, a movement which just pulls yeah. it forward, right? Yeah. So I'll use uh, in those situations I'll use, you know, an arpeggiated synth a lot, even if it's just one note. Like it doesn't even have to be like a full patterned arpeggiato, just like an eighth note synth. Wah 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 wah. You know, whatever. These are the hi hats of the other instruments. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, shaker, tambourine. Um, if I'm writing guitars for it and I feel like that's a thing. How do I write a guitar part that doesn't step on the vocal, doesn't make the song too complicated, but has more movement than just strumming chords or than, you know, half note ringing out chords or whatever. Right, right. And so I try to, especially on a song like that, where I end up doing literally everything on it other than pedal steel, 
a banjo, especially in a country genre, banjo is one of my favorite for that because you. I play a little banjo. Do you? There yeah. you go. But it's come out about as about as often as my fiddle lately. <laughs> <laughs> but I think banjo is is such an incredible instrument to even tuck way in the background, and you know the banjo player is playing eighth or sixteenth notes, you know, and yeah. uh, it creates this 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 image of movement yeah. that the song wouldn't have without it. You were it. talking about tuning um, sharp and ahead of the beat um, creates some intense tension yeah. and, and flatter and, uh, and relaxed timing creates, or flatter and late yeah. equals relaxed. And, and it also it's like reminding us that parts uh, can pull the song forward or pull the song back. And where they fall on the meter can do that as well. So, you know, sometimes... Uh, like in a chorus. So let's let's say, I think even in that song is probably a pretty good example. Everything starts to move either on top of the beat or just the tiniest bit ahead of the beat in the chorus. But in the verses, it's very chill. It's very behind, on or behind. You yeah, know? yeah. It's why, you know, snare fills, uh, drum fills often tend to naturally want to speed up a little bit going yes. into the chorus and, be, and the chorus might be faster. And it's funny because we live in this world of, you know, grids and computer screens. And we, it's so easy to assume that the grid is right. Yes. When it's also very true that the grid might not be right, that, that the, the, the correct feel for a song might be for it to speed up slightly and pull ahead yeah. and then, and then come back. And do you off, do you ever uh, like change your, your tempo in the grid and stuff I, like that? I don't ever change a tempo. If, if I feel like that's the appropriate move for the song, I just won't use a click. Um, so I try to identify that ahead of the time. Most of the music that I work on is a little bit more popular oriented where it kind of, you kind of need to use a click, yeah. uh, need, I use the need loose, the word need loosely. But if I feel that way, you know, if I, you know, like rage against the machine killing in the name of speeds up like 15 beats a minute in the chorus or whatever, if I'm working on a song that that's an integral part of the song, we just don't use a click. Yeah. 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 That's good advice. And then of course, you know, the flip side is, uh, we're not implying the clicks aren't good, that they, they are absolutely good for the right thing. Totally. It's just sometimes they're not. And to add to that, sometimes an artist comes to me where the tempo of their song fluctuates and it shouldn't fluctuate. Right. It should be the same exact tempo. It should tempo. stay the same tempo, yeah. And, uh, and, and knowing, I think that's where the experience comes in. You know, you just have to, you have to fail a lot at making that decision before you can listen to a song and say, no, this needs to have a, a natural approach with no click track or no, this artist doesn't realize they're speeding up and slowing down. Uh, what they're trying to do is create intensity and their idea of how to create intensity is by speeding up when instead we should do that with production. Right, right. Yeah, good point. Um, another thing that I think um, is overlooked sometimes is the value of a click is just simply, it's like it's like a benchmark in the production process where you, mm -hmm. whatever overdub you're doing, you just have this thing that you can turn up loud. That's easy to know where the, you know, the Absolutely. center of the timing is. Yeah. It's, it definitely, I don't want to say it's a crutch, but there are definitely moments, uh, during a production. Well, for instance, any song that has a, a down section, like a, you know, after the bridge before the last chorus and it has a down section. Well, if you're not using a click, the drummer has to be on his hi hat. Right. He has right. to be doing something. Otherwise, the singer will never land in the right spot when the when the full band comes back in. Yeah. Uh, and so in those moments, it, you almost can't not use a click. That's a double negative. You can't not use it. <laughs> you can't not use no click, man. Or you have to be okay with the drummer with never actually laying out with everything, you know. Right. Or you have to be okay with the drummer keeping time and cutting it out. I mean, there's so many different options. Or it's got to be a no headphone session where everybody's looking at each other and making eye Absolutely. contact the whole time anyway Absolutely. or something like that. But then good luck with the overdubs. Good luck with the overdubs. And, uh, you know, that that thing has a real vibe too. And that's something else that I try. Is it is the right thing for the song band in a room? Or is the right thing for the song the drummer and the bass player? Or is the right thing for the song 100% separate overdubs? Because all of those things have a vibe. And uh, I'm pretty adamant about trying to find what is the right vibe for the song. I just what wrote approach. down good luck with all the overdubs. Good I luck like, with all the overdubs. It just overdubs. sounds like a book title or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So let's jump into our closing questions here. Okay. Um, when you started out and recording, what was holding you back? 
A uh, couple things. Um, one was thinking big picture. Uh, I had this, uh, this is a little philosophical and a little like career oriented more so than audio oriented. I had this problem with only trying to solve the problems that were right in front of my face and not thinking about what the ultimate scenario for my career looked like. Um, and so because of that, I spent a lot of time going in circles on stuff that didn't matter. Uh, and I, it was just everything from how I conducted myself, the, where I focused my energy, you know, on uh, clients that didn't pay me or, you know, whatever the situation was. There was a lot of energy spent on things that didn't add to my forward momentum. I guess it's probably the best way that I could put it. All right. How about some of the best advice you remember receiving? I think it was Pensado's place. That was one of my few, my few mentors, I guess you could say. Shout out to you, Dave. Shout out Dave Pensado. We, we want you on the podcast sometime soon. Yeah, there you go. Uh, you know, like I was a very, like, I think I found Pensado's place on like episode three or four. And I remember the first time Jack Joseph Puig was on there episode 26 it was in the 20s and he was talking about how the magic is in the mid-range and that was like part of his philosophy and until i heard that i was like how do i make this kick hit harder and how do i you know oh clarity is just by boosting 12k of a high shelf right obviously like when you're young and you haven't really experienced much and you don't really have a mentor uh those were the things that that i thought were important how hard does the kick hit and how much clarity is created by the top end. And so when he, when I watched that episode, I, I would encourage anybody to try to go back and find that old episode because it was one of those things. I probably watched that episode 25 times and it, and I still don't think I actually absorbed everything that he was saying. Cause it was so deep. He was, he was talking philosophy on compression and it was just, it was crazy. Uh, and so the magic is in the mid range was a big one for me. And that set me down this path, uh, towards creating what if would be the best mixes of my career is just focusing on the mid range. And sometimes I don't even worry about the low end like at all. And if the mid range is right, a lot of times the rest of it falls into place. I think it was Carl Knapp on the show who said the mid range is the final frontier. Oh, I like that. Um, we were talking about that. Like you discover, like you said, the high end and you discover the boosts in the base and trying to control that. And then in the end, the mid range is it. Yes. And I, I find in my experience, the crankability of a track in the car is determined by, I turn it up until the mid range sounds loud. And if the bass and the treble are out of balance at that point, yes. that's when they don't feel right to me. Totally. And I think, you know, it, it's everything from does the mix sound harsh or warm or muddy or, you know, the every every word that we use to describe audio can be used specifically about the mid range. You can solve those problems with the mid range. Share a recording tip hack or secret sauce, something the rock stars can use on their next session oh, today. Man. Um, we talking recording? Let's narrow it down to category. Anything, whatever pops okay. into your head. Um the microphone placement is infinitely more important than the microphone or the preamp you're using. Good tip. If like it, you can move a 57 one inch on a snare drum or a guitar speaker, and it has a far greater impact than completely changing the microphone altogether. But don't hold up the session trying all those different inches, rock stars. Unless you're not charging the client for the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let the drummer hit the drums. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, how about a uh, either a favorite hardware tool or something that you're kind of excited about right now in the studio? Mm. It changes. I, I I have this issue where I'm I use my tools to inspire me, and so it kind of changes all the time. I'm a sucker for compression. Um, I have I uh, just not all that long ago picked up a Serpent uh, SSL bus compressor, the four thousand one B, I think it is, or SB four thousand one. Um, it's it's a it's a clone of a, a G384. Is that the right SSL variant? 384? Uh, 385? I, yes. No, yes. I, don't, I don't know. Off the, top of my head. The, the, the bus compressor that was in the 4K consoles, it's a clone of that compressor. Um, sounds, it's just awesome. I'm just into that thing. It does what I want it to do. Uh, I just picked up, this is sounds so lame. I picked up an SM7 
and I've haven't owned Love one. Love that SM7. Yeah, haven't owned one for whatever reason, never owned one and I'm like this sounds great. Why have I never owned this? And it's the cheapest microphone I own, you know? Like, Have you tried the cloud lifter on it yet? I haven't. What do you think about that? Uh, it's pretty cool. I actually, I, I bought one for the studio and it disappeared. So I've <laughs> got to get another one. Um, it's one of the struggles of having a studio is sometimes keeping track of where you put that thing. 100%. Uh, especially but when I, you have this much gear. I just got an email from uh, one of the rock stars listening to Don Parsons. Shout out to you, Don, for yeah. uh, sending me that this morning. Um, you know, talking about... Uh, using the cloud lifter. So uh, that is a really useful tool on SM7. There you and go. I know it's a very useful tool on ribbon mics and stuff like that. Excellent. I'll have to try it. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. How about a, a software tool? Anything that you're excited about using? Any new plugins, DAWs, whatever? Uh, I just picked up uh, the complete bundle. Some cool stuff in that. Um, I'm really digging this, this Native Instruments synth called Super 8 they just came out with. And it's like, does kind of the Stranger Things, super 80s synth stuff. And I nice. just, that stuff is so fascinating to me, probably because I've never been a key guy. I've always been a guitar guy. And so keyboards and synths is kind of the, the new frontier for me. And uh, I have a feeling it's it's going to be a deep rabbit hole. It's a vast <laughs> frontier, dude. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm, my bank account is not going to thank me for so. <laughs> well, you know, I feel like the, the vastness is in the time. You just want to like even take one of those yeah. synthesizer tools that you got as a plugin and just and play with it and experiment until you understand how it works. Exactly. You know? Exactly. I, I had been using vacuum the stock pro tools synth forever and with great luck i mean it, it's fine like i never had a problem with it um and not trying to compare it to like a juno or something but like uh it was fine and then it, it became one of those situations where i was no longer inspired by that and i was no longer like um I don't think it was holding me back, but it, it it just wasn't giving me those creative juices. And I'm like, time to go on to something else. Nice. And then that opened, I downloaded the fab filter and waves element. And then that was like, okay, I got to dig way further into this world. And so that's my, is there my, a fab filter synth? Yes, there is the fab filter twin. Oh, cool. It's yeah, very cool. That. Very unique, creative routing options. All right. Dig it. Yeah. Dig it. Dig it. Um, how about a uh, resource for the business side of doing this? You, you, you mentioned some great tips already, but yeah. anything else uh, you want to share for those of us who want to do this for more than just a hobby? Yeah, um, I think I think it's really important to brand and market yourself appropriately. You know, it, I have more or less built my career on social media, um, even though my biggest, most successful clients did not come from social media. What allows me to pay my bills and keep doing this from day to day is clients that I get from social media. Uh, I, I just got my Instagram analytics today for the last seven days. And it's so crazy for me to even think about uh, my content is seen by 147,000 people a week, which is like, wow, it, you couldn't afford to pay for that level of advertisement. And, and advertisement is so generic and non-personal anyway. And so I think it's really important uh, for people that are coming up to take f social media is the new advertisement platform. It's what the newspapers used to be, what radio used to be, what TV is the, the end of the TV era. And now it's social media. And it's so easy and accessible to everyone but you have to use it right. And so if you're posting pictures of your cat and your dinner all the time, well, that's not going to gain you clients, you know? Uh, but if you're constantly branding yourself where it's, uh, your name is synonymous with what it is that you do and constantly, you know, like for years when I first moved to town, my, my thing was I needed to have coffee with four people a week I've never met. And, uh, that's a lot of people. It's, it's coffee. Like, yeah, three to four times a week for like two years. And now it's still a couple times a week. And, you know, that whole huge network of people and the idea that you have to have, and you have to figure it out. If you're a mastering engineer, you can master an album a day and maybe be okay. So how many days a year do you want to work? 260 you got to have 260 full album clients to stay busy. So being conscious and breaking it down like that of, of the quantity of work that you actually have to have in order to pay your bills. And then using that to drive 
yourself to create your network to know that many people because people work with people they know first and foremost over people that they don't know. Yeah, yeah, top of mind. Yeah, even if you're not the right person, like a lot of people will choose people that they know even if they're not the right choice. Um, So getting to know as many people as humanly possible uh, and using social media to drive that and and realizing that if you really spend the time creating high quality, interesting content that plays into what it is that you do, it's it's a it's an advertisement that you couldn't afford to pay for. I couldn't possibly afford to pay to put myself in front of 150,000 people a week. There's yeah. no way. It's fun to create content too. It's it's another creative expression too. Totally. And, and I kind of I kind of am interested in photography a little bit and I'm kind of interested in in like psychology. Well, not kind of. Being a producer is like 50% being a psychologist. Um but so that kind of transfers into the social media thing of like what makes people react. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, well, so I'm going to jump to our closing question Let's here. We'll it. take this hypothetical question. We're going to we we'll take the uh, the hypothetical way back studio machine. Okay. Um, and you're going to go back in time, find young Colt producing his first record on his on his core digital, you know, yeah. workstation uh-huh. by the dark river, down by the dark river. Uh-huh. You say, and you're knocking the door, you open it up. Young Korg answers. A uh, young Colt answers. And uh, you say, yo, dude, I've come to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. Yeah. What advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? Be open-minded. Don't, don't get closed into genres or what is hating on what is popular. Um, I was totally that guy that I was like, ah, you know, not new country, but like, I'll use that as an example. Oh, new country sucks. It doesn't. You just feel that it sucks. It sucks to you, but a whole bunch of other people like it. And so I wish that I could tell my 19 year old self to be open-minded and, and accept that everyone has different tastes and different likes and different dislikes. And you're just one person in a vast sea of people that do music or that enjoy music and uh, just do the very best that you can, regardless of what you think about it. That's good advice, man. Good advice. Well, so um, how can the rock stars find you online, how they can totally connect with you, follow you on social media, come Uh, make the next record. My most active uh, platform is Instagram and it's just at Colt Caparoon. Let's go back to that branding thing we talked about. Uh, It's Colt Caparoon on Facebook. It's coltcaparoon.com. It's Colt Caparoon at gmail.com. It's whatever there is that I'm on. It's just Colt Caparoon. So Colt, C-O-L-T, Caparoon, C-A-P-P-E-R-R-U-N-E. That's good. Dig it, man. Yes. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being on the podcast with us. Um, I guess a quick question about that yeah. too. Uh, do you actually do like social media branding coaching and stuff like yeah, that for people so as I well? Do, I do artist development and uh, social media coaching. Uh, and, and the way that I do it is I don't actually do anything for anyone, but I, I'm all about the coaching side of it. Groovy, groovy. Yeah. All right. So rock stars, reach out if you need, uh, need any advice. Excellent. Groovy. Thank you so much for having Thank me. Thank you for being on the show, dude. A total yes. pleasure hanging out with you. It was a pleasure. It was mine. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. Also, remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with these weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free mixing course at mixmasterbundle.com. Look for the link in the show notes. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio, all totally free. Thanks for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music.